A couple months ago, I was doing my nightly routine at about 2 a.m. After I finished getting ready for bed, I took my dog out, and when she came in, I turned off all the lights in the house. I walked in the kitchen and over to the light and didn't see anything. As soon as I turned off my light, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I turned and saw a tall, skinny, white, humanoid creature thing sitting at the head of the dining room table. I ran with my dog and went to my room, and the energy felt off for the rest of the night. There are also some more experiences that have happened when I was younger and more recently that are probably unrelated to this as well, such as hearing voices talk when I was younger and weird sounds over my house. Last night I got a call from a military buddy that he was looking for a ride home from the bar and didn't want to spend 30 on an Uber ride. I said sure I was hungover myself and figured it would help to drive with the windows down and get some air. It was probably 12.30 a.m. and I was driving around my neighborhood trying to take an alternate route that I hadn't taken before but knew about, basically one that went through residential areas and stayed off of the bigger, more populated routes. I didn't really want to fight traffic the entire way getting downtown. So as I'm driving everything was normal, I was listening to some random podcast about World War II. But then, as I'm passing this one random house a couple streets down from mine, there's a kid standing in the front yard, right on the edge of the road. To be honest, this doesn't sound that weird, but looking back, it was past midnight, and this kid was maybe 10, 11 years old. He had on a red shirt. Then shorts and sneakers with a blonde bowl cut. Totally normal looking kid. So as I'm coming up to this kid, I get to a speed bump and head slow down. So I was able to get a better look at him. He wasn't playing. He wasn't running around. No other kids were with him. He was just standing completely still and meeting my gaze as I'm going past. Like the entire way down the street, he doesn't stop staring. And after I had passed him, I keep looking at my rearview mirror, and he still doesn't stop looking. He doesn't cross the street or go back to playing around. He just keeps standing there, staring at my truck. On the drive back, I told my friend after picking him up about the kid, and he was interested. So I took him back through the same way where I saw the kid this time he wasn't there. Fast forward to when me and my friend get back to my place sitting in my living room, shooting the shit watching YouTube, and we hear this super fast, quiet knocking at the door. Like so quiet, my AC almost completely smothered the sound. It's like 1.30 a.m. at this point, and both my roommates are out of town for the long weekend. So I was kind weary of answering the door. I peek out the window next to the front door and see no one there. Honestly, this could have just been a tree limb hitting the roof near the front door. But in that moment, it was like I was having a heart attack thinking I'd see that kid there. Later, when I was in bed just laying there, I heard a few more random knocks in different places. My bedroom is right next to the front door and goes out onto the patio that the front door connects to. These knocks could have been at the front door or just in some random spot in the house. At this point, I was so tired I really didn't really care to worry a bit and passed out. Waking up this morning thinking about it, those knocks creeped me out a bit more. But just doing a walkthrough of my front patio, nothing was out of the regular, so there's not much else to go on. I know this really isn't the most bone-chilling story, but kind of goes to show how kids can be so creepy with zero effort. This happened when I was an infant. My father was driving me and him to meet up with my mother and older brother at our grandparents' house. It was some sort of family emergency, mild heart attack if I remember correctly. This was in the south where my father is from. He's heard all sorts of creepy stories and occurrences and loves to tell them. As he tells it, it was the middle of the night. He got a call about the family emergency and picked me up from the babysitter and left right away. There's a bridge that he's driven many times before in his youth. 
the type of bridge that's popular in horror movies. It crossed a wide river and was covered in fog so you couldn't see the other side. My father was in the military and made this drive many times to visit his parents. He says he's heard of strange happenings on the bridge, but had never seen any. Well, this night, about halfway across the bridge, he finds a truck with a hood open and a man frantically waving for him to stop and getting into his line of travel. My father says he looked harmless enough, just a guy with a breakdown, but such an odd place for one. Dad just doesn't feel right about this situation. So he guns it and honks, pretty much letting the guy know to get out of the way or get hit. The man dived out of the way, and my father sees three more men get out of the bed of the truck, slam the hood closed, and start to turn around. My father served as military police for a long period and knew exactly what to expect. He drove as fast as he could to a turnoff he remembered from his previous trips. This next part confuses me, but he claims it made sense. He believed he couldn't outrun our pursuers, so he pulled off at the small dirt road he knew. He drove as far as the road allowed, which apparently was still in sight of the main paved road, and got out of the car with me in his service pistol. My mom loves the next part. He gave me my bottle and favorite stuffed animal and placed me in my car seat behind a tree. Then he went to the opposite side of the small clearing and waited. I'm sure people will be confused, but he knew if they found the car, he would, hopefully, shoot first and end it quickly or draw them away from me. He says it only took a few moments before the truck, probably filled with crazy hillbillies, drove past and out of our lives. After waiting a little, he made his way back across the bridge to the next town and brought the local cops to the bridge. They said they had heard of missing people heading down that road, but had never found anything. Again, they came up empty. Wish I knew if they ever got caught. Edit, not exactly secluded, but in the area where the film deliverance is supposed to have happened. So I count it. As a Forest Service employee, I had spent countless hours in the wilderness. Anyhow, this happened at Music Creek, southeast of Estacada, Oregon. It was late, and darkness had settled over the landscape like a heavy shroud. I was driving along the winding road, my headlights cutting through the gloom, casting in glow on the surrounding trees. The stillness of the night was broken only by the hum of my engine. And then it happened. In the fleeting moment that my headlights illuminated the road ahead, I saw it, a massive figure darting across the asphalt. Its size alone was enough to send chills down my spine. Towering at a staggering seven to eight feet tall, it was a dark silhouette against the night, moving with an astonishing speed down the slope. My heart raced, and a surge of adrenaline flooded my vein. What had I just seen? Could it be possible? In that split second, my mind grappled with the unimaginable. Was this a Bigfoot? The stories that had circulated throughout the region suddenly took on a new meaning. I'd always regarded them as mere folklore, stories passed down through generations. But now, confronted with this inexplicable sight, I couldn't deny the possibility that these held some grain of truth. I brought my car to a screeching halt, my hands gripping the steering wheel tightly. My gaze remained fixed on the spot where the creature had disappeared into the darkness. Fear mingled with curiosity, and a wave of trepidation washed over me. Should I investigate further? Should I pursue this enigma that had crossed my path? Part of me longed for answers, a desire to unravel the mysteries that lay hidden within the depths of these woods. But another part, a voice of caution, urged me to retreat. The unknown can be a dangerous realm. And venturing further into its clutches might invite consequences beyond my comprehension. Reluctantly, I made the decision to drive away, leaving the shadowy figure behind. Good morning as I sit reading this article. It amazes me that no one caught one of these things yet. I understand that if something with a 25-30 feet wingspan flies past you, you're not going to grab your camera as a first instinct. My son and I saw this thing in the summer of 2010 in Mertztown, Pennsylvania. 
We were parked on the side of the road in a heavily wooded area when this thing casually glided up the road. It looked big enough to carry a full-grown man away with no effort. When the winged thing flew over the hood of my car, we instantly ducked down. This thing had a round, human-sized head with no beak and huge bat-like wings. Now, I would never tell this story if it wasn't for my 16-year-old son sitting in the back seat who also witnessed it on that summer day. I'm a pretty capable guy. Not too many things can shake me. But this thing scared me. Here is what I saw. The body was five, six feet in length accessible. The wingspan was 25, 30 feet easy. No feathers, bait-like skin, jet black in a four or five feet skinny rat or dragon, like tail that stuck straight out. This thing didn't fly like a bird. It glided about 10 feet off the ground at a plodding speed. After fifty, seventy-five feet of gliding, it took one huge flap of the wings, never changing elevation, and glided up the road till it disappeared into the woods. I'm convinced this thing lives underground, probably near some sort of hot spring, because it has no feathers. Well, that's my story. Feel free to reply with any questions. That forty-five second event will forever be etched into memory. I say we find it and catch it. I would love to see it again up close. I remember that day as a day like no other in my life as a hunter. It was a cool morning as I ventured into the forest, eager to track down the prey that would provide sustenance for my family. As I roamed deeper into the woods, I spotted a stag. Its antlers reached towards the sky, and the way the sun glistened off its coat made it seem almost mystical. This was no ordinary stag. It was a creature of sheer beauty, unlike any I had encountered before. I aimed my rifle, my heart pounding in anticipation. The shot was precise, and as the stag fell, I couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction. I knew this kill would provide us with ample meat for the upcoming months, and my family would be grateful. What made this stag even more remarkable was a large jet black spot under one of its eyes. It was like a unique signature, a mark that set it apart from any other animal I'd ever hunted. The next day I decided to venture to a different part of the forest. The thrill of the hunt was in my blood, and I couldn't resist the call of the wild. As I cautiously peered through my scope, I spotted another stag. It was a beautiful creature, and as I focused my sight, my heart stopped. It couldn't be, but it was. The stag had the same distinctive black spot under its eye. My mind raced with confusion. How could this be? Was it possible that this was the same stag I had killed just a day ago? I couldn't fathom it. It was as if the spirit of the animal I'd taken had returned to haunt me. My hands trembled as I took aim once more. My fingers squeezed the trigger, but this time my shot missed its mark. The stag turned and our eyes locked. It felt as if the creature peered into my very soul and the chilling sensation sent shivers down my spine. In an instant the stag bolted, disappearing into the dense underbrush. I was left standing there feeling an inexplicable unease. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had encountered something beyond the realm of the natural world, something haunting. I returned home, my thoughts filled with question. Was it the same stag, or had it been a mere coincidence? So this is something that I'm still experiencing to this day, like literally as I'm typing this. I'm just gonna start at the beginning. I live in a rural area surrounded by woods, and that's about it. A few years after moving here, me and my father started hearing things in the woods at night. It started off just sounding like an animal until we both heard what sounded like a little girl saying hello. When looking around with my father, no one was found. This continued for years, but never to this extent. A few months ago, I was walking home from taking up the trash. It was around 9 p.m. and dark. As I walked, I could hear something following me in the woods next to me. 
I assumed it was just a squirrel or something until I heard laughing directly in my ear. Loud. I was unable to run due to a mild leg injury at the time, so I just called my mom as I walked home. Nothing else happened that night. After that, our dogs would start barking like crazy every night at around that same time. Then, starting a few months ago, this thing started trying to imitate our dogs. We always let the dogs in at 7 p.m., and around 9 p.m., the barking would start. The barking in question, though, is very obvious, not natural. It is almost human-like and follows a strict pattern. Bark, one second. Bark, bark, three seconds. And repeats for about 30 minutes before stopping. Once stopping, there will be taps and scratching on my window for a few minutes before everything stops completely and returns to normal. No one else in my house really cares as much as I do, and I know I'm probably overreacting. There is probably a decent explanation to this, but for now I'm going to assume it's some sort of skinwalker or crawler. I'm an ecologist, used to work as an environmental monitor for some pretty remote mining operations here in Australia. Long backcountry driving, taking water samples upstream. And downstream of the mine. That sort of thing? Most field days you're looking at about a 12-14 hour day, and you're unlikely to see another human being the entire time. During the shorter daylight months, I'd often be starting and finishing work in the dark. About a month into the job, I noticed when driving down the roads through the scrub after sunset, there were all these little glimmering reflections on the road and in the grass, as if there were lots of little specks of broken glass, reflecting back my vehicle spotlights. After a seeing this every evening for a couple of months, I decided to find out what it was, got out of the truck, walked over to one, and realized it was the reflecting eyes of a spider, coming out to begin their night's hunt. I must have passed millions of them before finding out what they were. One night a few years ago, my aunt and I were driving down a familiar road we had traveled countless times before. It was a typical evening, nothing out of the ordinary until something caught my attention. Out of the corner of my eye, I glimpsed a fleeting figure darting across the road and disappearing into the woods. I couldn't shake off the strangeness of what I had just witnessed. The creature I saw was unlike anything I had encountered before. It was smaller in size, hunched over, with a grayish complexion and sparse hair. The way it moved reminded me of a chimpanzee or some kind of primate. Instantly, I knew it wasn't a raccoon or any other familiar animal that I was accustomed to seeing in the area. Living on the East Coast, I was accustomed to the local wildlife and had seen my fair share of creatures in the region. However, this sighting was completely out of the ordinary. The image of that peculiar creature lingered in my mind, and I couldn't help but wonder what it could have been. I immediately shared my observation with my aunt, expressing my bewilderment at the sight we had just witnessed. She too was taken aback by the strangeness of the encounter. It was clear that this was no ordinary animal crossing our path that night. In the years that followed, I kept an eye out during my travels, hoping to catch another glimpse of that mysterious creature. However, it seemed that the sighting was a singular event, a fleeting encounter with an enigmatic being. Despite my curiosity, I never came across anything similar again. To this day, the memory of that night remains etched in my mind. I often find myself pondering the nature of the creature I saw and the mystery surrounding its existence. Was it a rare and elusive species that had managed to remain hidden from human eyes? Or perhaps it was a creature from folklore, venturing into our world for a brief moment. While I may never know the true identity of the creature I encountered that night, the experience has left me with a sense of wonder and an appreciation for the unknown. It serves as a reminder that there are still mysteries waiting to be unraveled, even in the familiar landscapes we think we know so well. So as I continue my journeys and explore the world around me, I keep my senses sharp, 
ready to embrace it. Unexpected in an embrace the possibility of encountering something extraordinary. Who knows what other secrets the night may hold, just beyond the reach of our ordinary perceptions. Years ago, I lived at a cabin with my husband and young child, three-year-old and one dog. The layout of the house plays a role. The front door lead to the living room, and there was a small hallway that led to kitchen and our kids' room off to the right. In the hallway, there was a bathroom L and main bedroom R off it. Our dog used to sleep in the hallway. It was late, and my husband and kid were sleeping. I had been in the living room watching TV. I had heard a noise like a whine or like I was being called, and it made me jump. It was weird. It was sounding like my kid, but not really... But at that point, I had just assumed it was her. So I had walked down the hallway. The dog was sitting up staring at my kid's room, so I stepped around her and walked over to my kid's room. My child was sitting straight up, looking straight, not making a noise. I laid her back down and went back towards the living room. Again, I heard the same odd, hard-to-describe noise and walked back down to her room. Again, the same thing. The dog looked on edge as well. I stayed up for a little while to make sure she has gone back to sleep and to get dog to relax. I eventually went into the bedroom and laid down. Still, my ears were on high alert given the circumstances. I laid there for a while trying to sleep, but it seemed like something was stopping me from relaxing enough to actually fall asleep. I tossed and turned a bit. I had been laying on my right side facing my closet, and when I rolled back onto my back, I saw something that has forever stayed with me. I legit see it so clearly as I write this. At the end of my bed stood a small boy, probably seven or eight. My eyes literally couldn't blink. I was shocked but not terrified like most would think. I was bewildered because I could see him clear as day. Young boy with a hat and tan. His clothes with suspenders. I swear on everything he said something, and I turned away, because now I thought I was losing my mind. Not only could I see him clear as day, but now I could hear him speaking. It sounded like help. I rolled back toward the closet and closed my eyes real tight and was hoping he'd disappear. But nope, I was wrong. When I opened my eyes, he was now standing directly in front of my face. Like I said, he was seven, eight so his face was right in front of mine when I opened my eyes. While looking this boy straight in the face, he said something, and all I could think of was the TV shows that say, all you have to do is tell them to leave, and it's okay to move on. So I had reopened my eyes, hoping he was gone, and as I went to say, it's okay to pass on and to please leave my home. I got 99% of it out, and I said the last word. I clearly heard him and watched him raise his right hand slightly and said no. Waiting when I blinked, he was gone. Scared shitless, I got up, checked my kid's room. She was fast asleep. My dog was relaxed now, asleep in the hallway, and nothing seemed weird anymore. I laid back down, freaked out, and thinking I was going crazy. At some point, I fell asleep. The next day, I told my husband and best friend. My boyfriend completely was taken aback by it and how out of this world it was, and my husband was shocked he didn't hurt anything while it was happening. The image of this boy has stayed with me ever since. I googled the property that I was living in at that point to see if any children who looked like him had gone missing and never could uncover anything shady. The property was at the location of a war that was fought and there were a couple youngins who had gone missing, but nothing concrete. I've had random odd things happen, like feeling someone run my head from behind, but this, this is something that has always stayed with me. His face is just as detailed today as it was over a decade ago. I attached a pic of a boy wearing a similar type outfit as the boy that I had saw. I went on a GAP semester as part of a cohort of 15 students in the Wind River Mountain Range for 26 days. We were doing a and OLS course without technology for a learning requirement for first-year students. Awesome opportunity. 
Anyway, it was getting late, and our LOD, leader of the day, was upset because it was getting dark out, and this was the final stretch in a group of five. We were split into packs of five near the end. So we happened upon a tucked-in corner at a high altitude that looked to be an old camp. By this point, it was too dark to carry on, so we scouted out the area. It was unsettling because there were bear traps everywhere. There was no sign of life, but a distinct humming noise was omnipresent. Out of curiosity, I walked into a tent with a friend, and there were three rusty chainsaws and a rotting leg of some animal. It smelled awful. There was no food except for a few cans that had expired three years prior, but the humming got louder. There was also a video camera inside, with a note on the ground that read, I haven't forgotten. At that point, we decided to leave really fast and traveled three more miles to distance ourselves. Those three miles with nothing but flashlights in the pitch dark was one of the most nerve-wracking times of my life. It may have honestly been nothing but five guys who had to get to the final landing point in three days without seeing people for a week was enough. I marked the approximate coordinates on my map at the time, and I may have it in my desk at home. I'll try to post it if I find it when I'm on break. I'm a 22-year-old archery hunter that lives in and hunts Nevada. I still hunt to this day, but this is something that definitely shook me up back in the summer of 2017. I was mule deer hunting, and after a long, hot summer day of hiking and searching, I had finally spotted some deer across the canyon that had bedded down under the shade of a thick mahogany tree patch on top of the opposite mountains from me. The sun was setting, and since I liked the time to make a multiple-hour sneak, I decided I would return to camp and hike up early the next morning while it was still dark so I could have a good chance at spotting them going down to water at first light. At about 3 a.m., completely dark still, I headed out of camp and up into the darkness with my bow and pack. At first, the ascent up the mountainside was wide open sage country and was somewhat lit by a full moon and an incredible showing of stars. So I opted to not turn on my headlamp and to walk amongst the stars. Once I had gotten to the ridge line, I was faced with a thick row of mahogany trees that followed the whole ridge up to the peak. The transition from vast, open, starlit, sage-covered mountainside to the enclosed mahogany canopy was like entering another world. Anyone who's been in a thick mahogany or aspen patch knows how. Confined it can feel. It was already dark, but it was another level of dark and quiet under the thick mahogany canopy. I turned on the headlamp and ventured into the thick mahogany patch. A nighttime hike like this was nothing new for me, but after about the first half mile in that confined, dark, completely quiet, mahogany jungle, something just felt wrong, the type of wrong that makes neck hairs stand up and send stingles through your body. I nervously covered the next few miles with only a few breaks. About half an hour before sunrise, I made it the spot, sat down in the darkness, and waited quietly with my binoculars for the sun to rise. The sun rose, and the deer were nowhere to be found. It was a disappointing morning, sitting on the mountaintop, looking through my binoculars for the deer to no avail. At about noon, I decided it was time to head back to camp and regroup. I started back into the mahoganies to find my tracks to follow back to camp. As soon as I found my tracks, I noticed something that made my blood run cold. Alongside and even inside my bootprints, massive mountain lion tracks. The mountain lion tracks ran the entire length of my three-mile nighttime hike I had done just a few hours before. The lion tracks even circled and paced around the spots I had taken my breaks at. Less than ten yards away from where I would been resting, I had been stalked in complete darkness for more than two hours in the entirety of three miles by a 200-plus pound predator that can crush my skull with a single bite, all without having the slightest clue it was there.
Maybe this doesn't belong here, and maybe it isn't much of a story. It has the advantage or disadvantage of being true. About a year ago, my mother died suddenly of a brain hemorrhage. There were no warnings, no signs. She was quite young. My sister and I found her body slumped over in the bathroom. I spent much of the next few months in a haze of grief and drunkenness. I slept little and dreamt less. The few dreams I did have were vivid and strange. My mother's voice calling from the dark. She was puzzled and incredulous when I tried to tell her that she was dead. One dream in particular stays with me. In this dream, my mother was not enshadowed in dark, but shining with brilliant light. She looked younger and more carefree than I had seen her in a long time. She smiled when she saw me and... I ran to hug her. I asked her how she was doing. She laughed and said she was at peace. Then she grew a bit more serious. She told me not to worry about her. It was me she was worried about. She could see the state I was in. She told me that she wanted me to feel the peace she was feeling. She told me I should join her where she was. Her voice remained light and loving. I backed away a few paces from her. What are you saying, Mom? I asked. Come on, sweetie, she said. You're a drunken, miserable loser. What do you have to look forward to? Just do it. It'll be quick and easy. Over before you know it. I shook my head. You're not mom, I said. And then the thing wearing my mother's skin grinned at me, a big gleaming rictus like a mouth being forced open with fish hooks. It shot me a little wave and then it disappeared. Then I woke up. I'm doing better now. I'm drinking less. I'm in therapy, and I have my family's support. Life is good. I just hope that I never have to see that smile again. It was back in February 2007 in rural Indiana. I worked overnight shifts at a warehouse. We'd been let off work a little early, and I was following a co-worker down the road when I noticed he swerved off to the right side of the road, then swerved back onto the road and continued driving. I assumed maybe he wasn't paying attention or something ran out in front of him, but as I got closer, I saw a very tall black shape walking in the middle of the roadway. I, too, had to swerve, but I essentially came to a full stop as the thing walked next to my driver's window. I never saw a head on it, and I didn't even see any arms. It looked like a large person wrapped up in a black blanket or cloak. The movements when I first saw it in the headlights were not like any sort of person or animal that I've recognized. I relate it to flapping in the wind like those inflatable wacky arm men you see in front of stores or car dealerships sometimes. It took a step and flailed its torso around, then another step and more flapping. Very unnatural movements. When it walked by the vehicle, it was considerably taller than my explorer. It was leaning forward like a person who used a walker, but even leaning, it was still a foot or so taller. My explorer was 67 according to Google, so this would have made it almost seven tall while leaning forward. It had two very thick legs and a very thick torso, but I didn't see any hair, any clothing, nothing but solid black or dark brown. I couldn't make out any details other than that. When the red taillights lit it up as it was behind the vehicle, I could see between both legs, but the legs were solid, not translucent, as they blocked out the lights. So they had to have been solid. Anyways, I drove down the road and saw my co-worker had pulled off into a gravel parking lot. I pulled up next to him and he asked if I saw it and how it didn't have a head. I said I was going back to look for whatever it is, because obviously it's something strange. We ended up heading back the way we came, and I was in front. As we got back to the same general area, I saw a large black dog lying in the middle of the road. Now, for a dog, it was a lot bigger than any normal dog I've seen. But it was just lying in the road and looked like it was dead. So the first thing I assumed was that's what was walking in the road. Maybe it got hit by a car and was flopping around. It looked like a large black German shepherd type dog, but it had really thick, puffy fur like a chow dog. I got out to see what it was, and the dog raised its head up and looked back at me, growling with a low grumble. Its eyes reflected the headlights, 
so they looked like they were glowing yellowish. I stopped about 15 feet away from this dog, and it started trying to stand up, but it sort of hobbled a bit, then stood up directly on its hind legs and looked at me. It was standing up like a person, not how a normal dog would appear to be standing up, but how a person normally would. It had to have been around six foot tall. I'm six foot three, and it was almost my height, I would guess. It stood there for just a second or two and then got down on all fours and ran off the road into the trees, but I never actually saw it using its front legs. It had ears on top of its head, a normal dog-looking face. It didn't have stereotypical hands like werewolves or other dogman depictions. It had all the features of just being a very tall black dog that could stand up on its hind legs. It wasn't a bear, I can tell the difference. Bears also don't have pointed dog ears. We also don't have bears in Indiana, supposedly, but we also don't have upright, walking canines, so... The area it ran to is a deer preserve, and it has about an eight or nine foot fence that goes around the whole area. I don't know where it went, but it disappeared once it got out of the headlights. By this point, my co-worker got out of his car, and I walked back toward him. We were both wondering what was going on. I happened to glance down, and standing between us was a normal-looking field mouse. It was also on its hind legs and using its front legs to clean itself. It looked all wet, and it hadn't been raining or snowing outside, so I wasn't sure how it was wet other than cleaning itself. I tried to nudge it with my shoe, but it didn't care. It just stayed there, wiping itself. We left, uh, got home, and looked up weird walking dogs. I drew a picture and posted it on a forum, and someone said I must have come across a Michigan dogman. I had never heard of that before. I knew about werewolves and stuff from movies, but I'd never heard of dogmen. I went back to work a few nights later and tried to tell my co-worker about what I found, and the rest of the guys started laughing at me. So he got pissed off and basically threatened me to shut up about it. Or he would just deny it happened. So I stopped talking about it and never really told anyone else for almost 15 years. I told my wife and a couple of close friends, but I don't even think they really believe it, and I struggle to believe it myself. Logical reasoning would say it was a hurt dog. It was playing with this mouse and got hit by a car, broke its front legs, and was hobbling around because it couldn't use them. That's why the mouse was wet and traumatized, because the dog was messing with it. I can explain everything else away, except the first thing walking in the road was so much bigger than the dog. I can accept everything else but that. This is why I started my podcast. I never felt like I could share my experience without people saying I'm insane. If someone told me it happened to them, I would also think the same thing. It's hard for someone who doesn't believe in this sort of stuff to have to question their own perception of reality. The book I wrote was heavily influenced by that night in my own life to an extent because this is something that's haunted me for a while. Now some may think, oh, he wrote a book, so it's clearly false, and I wouldn't blame anyone for thinking that. I wrote my experience into a fictionalized book, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's my own way of continuing to deal with the situation, is how I feel. At the end of the day, I don't know what we saw. I don't necessarily believe in dogmen, but I also don't know what to believe just because I saw something unexplainable. It would be so much easier to dismiss it and say it's all fake, and I wish it was, honestly. I was hoping you may be able to help. My research partner and me have a bit of a problem with a dogman at his cabin here in southeast Ohio. We have been researching the Ohio Grassman for about two years together. Well, now we have this dogman really becoming a problem. Since January 3rd of this year, this thing has been pissing on his cabin about four feet up in various spots. It has taken a frontal bite out one of his trees. It slashed one of them. It hangs out in the wee hours most nights, growling all around his cabin. We have it on video, audio send trail cam, so we know what we are dealing with. We are just asking for some advice on how to deal with it.
This place where his cabin is is a campground that is primarily closed for the winter. There are a handful of year-round residents, but a total of maybe eight. It is opening up for the season now, and we don't want anyone getting hurt. It is more of an upright dog than a wolf. He is getting more aggressive with time. My partner being an ex-army ranger does not scare easily, but this thing finally wore him out to the point he left his cabin and went back to his homestead to regroup. Our thinking at the moment is to try and take it out. We started on a plan that we think will work. Problem being, we think there is more than one. The are grassmen all around this area. We have them on audio and photos, but neither is deterring the others. Any advice you have would be greatly appreciated. We don't really want to kill it, but it's getting to that point. We also don't want to draw attention to the area. The last thing we want is s bunch of people running around looking for it. Thanks for your time. My mother just told me that a few days ago, on her way to work at 5 a.m., she saw red eye shine in the corner of her eye from her headlights. She tried to look at what had caused it, but what she saw made her shiver. The creature was about my father's height, which is six feet or more, and had turned towards the cornfield after looking at my mother's vehicle from the side of the road. As she passed it, all she could see was the back end. She described it as a naked man with dark gray or black wolf-like hair with no tail. After she passed it, she kept watching it and saw it turn its head to look at her. But it did not turn its body, unlike how a Bigfoot would. Its body remained still. She said she saw incredible intelligence, but also felt an evil presence. A few months prior, on my way home from work at 11.30 p.m., I saw red eye shine, and then a large creature sped across the road. About 3,000, 4,000 yards in front of me, it had black fur, a long muzzle with a large head, broad shoulders with what seemed like a mane around it, large and long front and back legs at a strange angle, and no tail. When it happened, the first thing that came to my mind was an impossible mix between a wolf and a wild boar. At the time, I didn't know about the dogman, but after learning about it, that's what I believed that creature had to be. All of these incidents occurred in Morrow County, Ohio. Another sighting happened last week outside of Mount Vernon, Knox County, Ohio, about 35, 45 miles from our house. I'm from a small Midwestern town. Nothing like what I saw happens here, to my knowing, and is pretty much completely normal. This took place in fall of my seventh grade, so around 2016, 2017. Even though it was a few years ago, I know that I saw something, but I'm not 100% sure what I saw. By the way, I'm telling this in first person simply because it's easier. Kylie, my mom, called up the stairs. I quickly went towards her voice as she began to explain. Your dad and I are heading out for the night. She clipped in a gold earring. Do you mind walking the dog before we leave? I simply nodded in response, clipping in the dog's leash as she continued talking about what they were doing that night. It was late November night, and the sun had already set by the time my mom finished talking and the dog was clipped in and ready to go. I closed the front door and immediately felt chills not only from the temperature but the atmosphere. Not one person was out. It not that late, is it? I said to my dog with no response. I had made it half a street when my dog had stopped to sniff something on the ground. I looked out at the road ahead. Nothing but houses and one stop sign. My brain immediately thought back to a dumb video my friend and I watched, trying to scare ourselves in class. Where just like me, someone walking looks up at a stop sign to see a woman staring back at them, literally standing on the stop sign. I'm no one, I say, looking down from the bold red sign. I still couldn't shake a creepy feeling as I looked down the road. My heart stopped. I'll try my best to describe the horrifying sight I saw. Looking back at me was about an eight, nine feet tall, shadowy figure. Something with two legs tall and skinny, arms even longer reaching the ground, but just as skinny. 
the body round, completed with a long, skinny neck and no face. Once again, I say no face. I was purely terrified. I pulled my dog to run, but she was frozen. I yelled out to her, making it here then see me in the process. It began to follow us, in what I can only call a drunk on a tightrope walk. In response, I ran with all my night, cutting through my neighbor's backyard in the process. I slipped and fell, all while running on the muddy grass. I turned around, picking up my dog in one motion. It was even closer now. My head was pounding as I ran with tears in my eyes. Turning around, I fixed my grip on the dog and ran for my life. I opened my back door, throwing us inside. It's going to get me. I yell as my parents run to me, thank God they hadn't left yet. Truly believing I was almost kidnapped, my dad ran outside. I sat for the next few minutes sobbing, trying to explain the events that just occurred to my mom. My Ada walked in through the back door and simply said there's no one. Ever since that day, I've had terrible problems with anxiety and depression. To be fair, it could have nothing to do with what I saw. But I have to think a small part of it was from the pure terror I saw that day. My name is of no importance, for I am a CIA operative and anonymity is my shield. Today I find myself compelled to share a true story, one that defies explanation and haunts my thoughts to this day. And so I have chosen to submit my account to your YouTube channel, hoping to find solace in the collective disbelief of others. So it all began when I was deployed to the war toward an African nation of Congo. My mission was clear infiltrate a terrorist organization and gather vital intelligence regarding their plans for a possible chemical attack on a major city. The gravity of the task at hand weighed heavily upon my shoulders, and the stakes were as high as they could be. As an agent of the CIA, I had witnessed my fair share of atrocities and the horrors of war. Africa was something else. It was a place consumed by chaos and despair, ravaged by years of conflict, Yet amidst the devastation, something else lurked, something far more inexplicable. One fateful night, while on patrol deep within the dense woods, a feeling of unease settled upon me. The darkness was impenetrable. Suddenly, as if emerging from the very shadows themselves, I saw it. A creature resembling something akin to a yeti stood before me. Its unkempt brown hair hung loosely, swaying in the slight breeze. Its eyes a piercing yellow glow fixated on me with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. I watched in awe as it sniffed the air, its grotesque form devoid of a nose or mouth. It stood upright on two legs, a bipedal enigma that defied all logical explanation. Time stood still as I observed this inexplicable sight, but just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature vanished into nearby woods. I was left standing there, heart pounding and mind racing to comprehend the impossible. The rational part of me insisted it was a hallucination or a figment of my exhausted imagination. But deep down, I knew what I had witnessed was real. Seeking answers, I approached the locals the following day, inquiring about any known wildlife that matched the description of the creature I had seen. To my bewilderment, they shook their heads in confusion. They told me there were no such animals in those parts. No wild creatures with brown hair and glowing yellow eyes. It was as if the creature existed only within the boundaries of my perception. Now, as I sit here sharing my account with you, I am plagued by a maelstrom of questions. What was that creature? Was it a mere anomaly, a result of my mind playing tricks on me? Or was it something more, something that lurked in the depths of the unexplored, waiting to be discovered? My name is, well, you can call me Officer Brian. I work for a mid-sized police department in the outskirts of New York City. Myself and my partner have come across what we assume was a gag way while on patrol one night. 
after being called to a persisting issue with teenagers at an old abandoned warehouse right near the woods. The incident happened about three years ago now, so some of the details are foggy, but I remember for the most part exactly how it went. My partner and I arrived at the old warehouse to be greeted by a decent-sized group of rowdy teenagers. They were apparently having some party in there, but it was pretty clear that they got freaked out when we showed up. Everybody fled. My partner insisted that we go inside to check it out, which I thought was dumb because there was no way I was going on that place. Once we became aware of the situation, we also left. Not a minute after we got onto the main road did my partner get called to another call about an incident near a small farm outside of town. Before arriving, he told me that there had been a number of missing persons cases in all the nearby area. They were all adults. When we first arrived at the farmhouse, it was clear something really wrong had gone on there. The wife of the man who lived there was crying in the arms of a paramedic, and we were told by another officer there that she had discovered her husband's remains, his mangled corpse in the barn when she opened it up to feed their pigs. I was disgusted and confused. I couldn't figure out how something so violent could happen with anybody. After getting escorted to the barn, I couldn't believe how wrong I was. The man who lived there was a pretty big guy in his mid-fifties, and the way he looked now made me wonder if he put up a fight at all. He was badly mangled. I won't get into the detail other than his spine sticking out and his head twisted around. I had a difficult time getting a hold of myself while trying to talk to the wife of this man who was mutilated right there. After prying some questions, she eventually revealed that her husband went to check out on some pigs earlier in the night, but never came back. I wondered if he was taken or eaten by his pigs, since they were acting very strange. I knew deep down, though, that this wasn't done from a pig. This was from something else. I asked her what made her go out there, and she said it was because she heard snarling noises, and it sounded very out of place. Her husband did not come back either. She went on to say that she had heard these sounds before, but never paid much attention to them, that she had been hearing them a few days prior to this going on. I took her inside, convincing her I was sure everything would be fine. Meanwhile, my partner stayed behind with the other officers and assessed the scene while also having a look around the area for anybody or anything that could have had a connection or cause to this incident. One thing that really bothered me was that none of the other officers seemed to be concerned with the noises that I had heard. They didn't think it was connected to the man's death, but I knew better than anybody how violent and strange this was. I couldn't shake off what his wife had said about hearing those noises. This was the only thing I needed to keep looking into this. No one believed me. They said I was too new and didn't really know what I was doing. I'm still extremely disturbed by this whole incident. If you have any information on what happened or think you might know, I would love to hear your opinion. This is what I saw back in 1998, 1999. It happened in Ohio on a warm summer evening. I was sitting on my friend's deck, enjoying the peaceful night. Little did I know that I was about to witness something that would forever etch itself into my memory. It was a bit past midnight when it all unfolded. I remember gazing up at the sky, admiring the vast expanse of twinkling stars above. Suddenly a blue streak tore across the heavens, resembling a meteor but much closer, as if it were only thirty, fifty feet above me. It happened so quickly, leaving me in awe of the spectacle. But that was just the beginning. Only moments after the blue streak disappeared, I noticed something strange in the distance. Two figures emerged, standing taller than any human I had ever encountered. They seemed to materialize out of thin air, right before my eyes. My heart raced as I watched them, captivated by their presence. The figure in front turned its head as if acknowledging my presence on the deck. It locked eyes with me for a brief moment, and I could feel a sense of curiosity emanating from it. Then, without warning, they both started to fade away, gradually becoming transparent as they walked away. The encounter lasted no more than 20 seconds, but it felt like an eternity. 
There was no possible explanation for what I had just witnessed. It couldn't have been a trick of the light or any ordinary phenomenon. These beings were undeniably real, walking upright and emitting a radiant white glow. As I sat there, stunned by what I had seen, I knew deep down that sharing this experience would be met with skepticism and disbelief. The sheer absurdity of the encounter made it difficult for me to discuss it with others. So I kept it to myself, burying the memory deep within me. Over the years, I occasionally pondered the events of that fateful night, the blue streak, the enigmatic beings, and the inexplicable glow they emanated. I questioned their origin, their purpose, and whether there were others out there who had witnessed similar phenomena. But no matter how much time passed, the memory remained vivid and haunting. It became my secret, my personal encounter with the unexplained. And though I may never fully comprehend what I saw that night, I am forever changed by the undeniable reality of the extraordinary beings who crossed my path. To this day, I carry the weight of that encounter, knowing that sometimes the most extraordinary experiences are the ones we keep hidden, locked away in the depths of our hearts. Honestly, I don't know how much I believe in cryptids, but my mother once told me a story. It involves my great-great-grandmother and her neighbor, essentially her boyfriend. Later in life, after her husband passed away, the story was shared with my mother by this neighbor when he was still young. According to the neighbor, he and his friends were playing a game of hide-and-seek one day. It was a typical day in the 1910s. As he found a hiding spot nestled away from his seeking friends, something strange caught his eye. From the corner of his hiding spot, he saw a sight that would forever be etched into his memory. A long white creature emerged from a sewer drain, moving on all fours with an uncanny grace. Its form was unlike anything he had ever seen before. It seemed to possess a certain alien quality. Curiosity overwhelmed him as he watched the creature intently. It crawled with an eerie precision, almost as if it knew it was being observed. Without warning, it disappeared into another nearby sewer drain, leaving the young boy in a state of both awe and confusion. As my mother relayed this story to me, I couldn't help but be intrigued. The image of this mysterious creature crawling through the sewers lingered in my mind. What do you all think? And before you start, mother would never lie to me. A camp instructor I once had was mountain biking or camping somewhere in Canada with a mate of hers. It was up in the mountains in a really remote place. So she's biking around and they decide to set up camp in a clearing up on the trail. They see the clearing is perfectly round and the trees surround it so they can't see out. They're chilling making noodles near the tent as the sun's setting, and they see, around 10.15, people have surrounded them. The people are wearing dark robes, and apparently something similar to HP Death Eater masks. The masked people start stepping in unison and get closer and closer to them. They start freaking the F out and screaming at them to stop, then get on their bikes and kick some of the people away and ride down the mountain as fast as they can. They come across a cabin and start banging on the door, and a dude, a hunter of some sort, comes out. They explain the situation, and he radios his buddies to go check it out with him, Mac. Turns out that place is a high-action cult area, and there's been missing persons and people taken by cults. Oh, and when the hunter got there, all the tent and stuff was taken. My girlfriend and I were camping in the backyard in the west end of Council Bluffs, Iowa. The date was July 7, 1974. I noticed an object high in the sky, traveling from horizon to horizon like a satellite, except it was red and traveling somewhat faster and moving side to side in wave motion. Not a fixed pattern, but not exactly random either. It went much slower than a meteor. We stood up from our cots to better watch the skies. 
A short time later, we saw a disc-shaped object with red lights on its perimeter from a distance of about two miles. It seemed to be moving above the trees near the Missouri River or following the river itself. It was not quite hovering, but moving slowly while tipping on its sides and demonstrating to us that this was something very unusual. We watched it head south until we lost it below the trees. We stayed alert and debated if we should go to Lewis and Clark Monument, a park on the bluffs overlooking Council Bluffs in Omaha. About five or ten minutes after last, seeing the object, it flew almost directly over our heads. About a block away, now going north and still just above treetop level. We lost sight of it and decided to go ahead and drive to the park. On the way, we were driving through Big Lake Park, and I was keeping watch. I saw the object coming in our direction, still at treetop level, except I had the eerie feeling that it was coming for us. We panicked. I wanted to hide under the train bridge near the tennis court, and my girlfriend stopped the car about 50 yards short of the bridge. We ran to and under the bridge to hide. I've never experienced that kind of fear before or since, but, like a couple of prairie dogs, we felt compelled to peek out and see more of this incredible object. So we did. It was hovering above a large cottonwood tree near the tennis court about 50 to 75 yards away from us. It was still dark out. The disc looked about 100 feet in diameter, with large red rectangular lights flashing in sequence around its edge, which seemed to be about 15 feet thick. As we watched, frozen with awe and fear, it dipped its edge while hovering. One of the red lights went out, and in its place, a beam of light shot out of it and shined directly at us. The next thing either of us remember is that it was now daylight, and we were back in the car driving towards our original destination of Lewis and Clark Monument. We called police, and they said they had a report of something in Missouri Valley, Elwha, about 20 miles to the north. Animals were behaving strangely. Either they were oddly quiet or behaving wildly. When we drove back through Big Lake Park, there were people there who said they saw nothing. I don't really know how much time we're talking about here. In 1974, I had never heard of the phenomenon of missing time, but over the years I became well-schooled with the term. We make no claims of abduction. Dr. Casher of the University of Nebraska at Omaha, after hearing my story, referred me to a hypnotist. I never went, maybe out of fear. I was afraid to know any more. To this day, I feel I know enough. My girlfriend and I went home that morning and drew identical pictures and repeated identical stories. You have to understand, at the time, I thought the world was coming to an end or something. In 1977, an article came out in Popular Mechanics about an incident that happened very near there involving a blob of molten metal falling 500 feet from an object similar in description to what we saw. Jacques Valley came to investigate that occurrence. That is why I repeat my story and will always harbor these hazy memories and questions. I've never seen or experienced anything like that since, but I feel it in my gut every day. My story begins in the unforgiving sands of the Iraqi desert during the tumultuous 1990s. I was a member of a highly trained special forces unit, prepared for the most challenging missions that wartime demanded. Our next operation would be like none other, one that still haunts my thoughts to this day. We received orders to infiltrate an enemy barracks situated near the heart of the desert. The mission was clear, our objective well defined. We boarded our aircraft, ten of us ready to face whatever lay ahead. The descent was treacherous. The sky above us filled with tension. But it wasn't the landing that would test our mettle. It was the unforeseen twist of fate that awaited us on the desert floor. As we touched down, it was clear that something had gone terribly wrong. In a miscalculation of our drop zone, we were scattered far and wide across the barren landscape. The desert swallowed us whole, and it was only by a stroke of luck that four of us managed to assemble at the agreed rendezvous point. My heart pounded with uncertainty as we tried to make sense of what had transpired. Our ranks were decimated, our brothers in arms missing, 
The camaraderie that had been our strength was shattered, replaced by an eerie silence. My voice trembled as I questioned the others. What happened to the team? One of my surviving comrades, his face etched with terror, began to recount a story that defied all reason. He spoke of a predator, an entity that defied explanation. It stood eight to nine feet tall, towering over like a giant among men. Its eyes, he said, were otherworldly large and eerily reminiscent of the cat-like eyes often associated with extraterrestrials. It was a creature draped in darkness, its cloak so inky that it blended seamlessly with its form. The description sent shivers down my spine. The predator was impossibly thin, skeletal and tall, a figure that defied the laws of nature. It appeared as if it had no discernible hands or feet, a being of the unknown. In its eyes, he emphasized, glowed with a sinister luminescence. According to my unit, this entity, this predator, had hunted down our fellow soldiers. They had been slaughtered one by one, their lives extinguished by an enigmatic force that they couldn't comprehend. The only reason we stood there was that we had fled when the predator descended upon our team. I was left in a state of disbelief, my skepticism warring with the horrifying account I'd just heard. Could such a creature truly exist? Or was it a result of fear and the fog of war? But as I looked into the eyes of my surviving comrades, I saw only the truth, the undeniable fear that clung to them. In the end, I had no choice but to believe them. The mission couldn't be abandoned, our duty to our country remaining unwavering. We pushed forward, our resolve steeled, knowing that an unseen predator lurked in the darkness of the desert, a sinister entity that would forever haunt our thoughts. We continued our mission, driven by a sense of duty, leaving behind the unfathomable terror that had cast its shadow upon us. This story may sound crazy, but hey, being overseas can do that to your brain. This is something I saw, and I can confirm it's true. You can do with my account whatever you want, so I never thought I would find myself in such a dire situation. But it happened. Over ten years ago, I was part of a Navy SEAL, a special forces stranded behind enemy lines during a covert mission in Benghazi. I knew that my training and resilience would be put to the ultimate test as I fought to survive against all odds. I'd always been an occasional basketball player finding solace in the court during my downtime. Back to the story, so our team was on a routine patrol when we were suddenly ambushed by enemy forces. We took cover, returning fire and desperately seeking an escape route. In the chaos of battle, my eyes caught something peculiar in the distance. Amidst the dust and sand, there stood a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It had the silhouette of a werewolf, but its entire form seemed to be composed of sand swirling and shifting with the wind. Two menacing horns adorned its head, and its eyes glowed with an otherworldly intensity. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing and for a brief moment time seemed to stand still. But in the midst of the fight, I knew I had to focus on defending my team. We were outnumbered and outgunned, but I refused to let fear consume me. With every ounce of strength and determination, I fought back. To make this account short, we managed to hold our ground, but the cost was high. One of our brothers, Jack, good man had fallen, leaving a void in our tight-knit unit. As the dust settled and the enemy forces retreated, we felt a relief. This ambush was unsuccessful. We had survived. But the weight of loss hung heavy in the air, overshadowing the survival we had achieved. Now to the cryptid, I couldn't shake the image of the creature I had seen, the sand-filled werewolf with horns. I still wonder, was it a mere hallucination, a trick played by the mind under extreme stress? Or was there something more lurking in the shadows of this desert? Please tell me I didn't lost my mind.
I spent two weeks backpacking in New Mexico a few years back, and I just have to say that it's pretty amazing how easy it is to disconnect when you're out there. Anyhow, we were in a group of five three-tenths, with a campsite up on the rim of a canyon, which had the benefit of a fantastic view, but put us over a mile away from the closest water source. I had really argued in favor of this site, so I was happy to volunteer to go get water and recruited my best friend to help me bring back a second water container. Man, am I glad he came with me. It was around dusk when we left, and honestly, we had a good time just chatting about how great the trip had been. This was our last night out. We'd already had our fair share of adventures running into a couple of bears and getting hit by an enormous storm. While we were above the tree line being the highlight, so we just got lost and reflecting on the trip and laughing about it all. It was definitely getting close to sundown by the time we had gotten the water, though, so we set off back to camp at a pretty quick pace, which kept the chatter to a minimum. On the walk back, I thought I had heard a few sticks crack off in the woods, but I really didn't think that much of it. We'd heard weird noises before, and the cracks weren't loud enough to come from bears. Anyways, we ended up getting back to camp fine, eating dinner, cleaning up, and heading off to bed without incident. At this point, I'll mention that, that although the stargazing in New Mexico is supposed to be really exceptional, I was never really blown away by the amount of stars we saw owing to a super bright moon almost every night keeping the sky fairly light at night. Anyways, everyone was in their tents when I heard what was still to this day the most blood-curdling high-pitched scream coming from a very close distance. It was very akin to a woman or child in severe pain, but with something still very distinctly otherworldly to it. Now I'd heard about the sounds that mountain lions make, but dance just one of those things that you don't understand until you've heard it. That's when I got scared, but the worst bit about it was that the noise had come from the side of my tent that was facing the canyon rim, and I was camped probably within ten feet of the rim. So this meant that the cougar was either less than ten feet away from me, or that it was doing some kind of ninja cat type moves up there on the canyon wall. I'm not sure which was scarier in my mind. Anyways, like I said, we've got five dudes and three tents, and the guy who's alone gets scared and doesn't want to be alone. So the other four guys all popped out of our tents, walked in a huddle over to his, and then strategically dropped off two guys before the final three scurried back into one tent, leaving a single tent empty, hopefully as a decoy. However, when we were out there, we didn't see the mountain lion which meant that we had a ninja cat on our hands, made all the scarier by the fact that mountain lions can weigh well over 100 pounds and keep the demeanor of your average pissed-off house cat. Anyways, I'm no longer falling asleep anytime soon and have my hiking poles in hand for protection when I swear that I heard the faintest little swishing sound on the outside of my tent. That death machine ninja cat was taunting me, just like my cap back home. Screw you, Carol Ann, you're a jerk on account of being related to this thing, by ever so lightly swishing its tail against the door to my rain fly. Admittedly to this day, I'm not positive that that's what was for sure going on. But the sound was real, and it was scary, and it's definitely what I thought was happening at the time. This next part has no such mystery to it, as previously stated, we had a really bright moon that night, and it had illuminated the walls of my tent, and the death cat took full advantage of this fact. As the cougar padded silently through our campsite, its shadow projected onto my tent, and my eyes followed that shadow as it crept straight through the middle of our campsite, while I forgot to breathe for a few minutes. Eventually, its shadow disappeared from the side of my tent, and I fell asleep about an hour later once my heart rate returned to fairly normal. When we woke up the next morning, no one had died, so we were actually pretty stoked about the whole experience. We saw a few faint tracks in the middle of the campsite, but otherwise there was no real evidence of it ever actually happening. We did report it to a ranger when we left the next day, and he told us that the cougar had probably stalked me and my best friend back from the water source, got confused when we disappeared into the tent, 
Apparently enclosed structures blow their minds. And the roar had been in frustration after it had lost its prey. He also mentioned that I probably would have been attacked had I gone to get water alone. So it was good that I brought a buddy. So moral of the story is always roll with your bros, cause you never known when a 200 pound cougar is gonna follow you for miles to try and eat you. The officer involved in this story goes by the name of Officer Michael Frankton, currently stationed at the 14th Precinct. So one night, about two months ago, he was sent to investigate a call of an animal trying to break into a house on the west side of town. The caller reported that they were not sure what it was and that it looked like some sort of large skeletal animal. When he got there and searched around the perimeter, he found no tracks or trace or evidence that would suggest any person or animal had actually come close to entering or tearing into the property. After entering into the home, which seemed completely normal, everything was closed up and locked as if nobody was there. He even searched all around inside just to make sure nothing had gotten in. He exited the house and walked around to check the perimeter again before his radio started going off notifying him that the officers had arrived on the east side of the property, where he would be able to help them with an animal control call. When he approached them, he told them that there was this large creature that looked like it might have been injured, hence the skeleton exposure in that this animal had possibly escaped and was injured and now darting all over the property. They brought Officer F back around to where the animal was initially sighted. Right up ahead of them was what they could best describe as something straight out of hell itself. It seemed almost like a hulking mass of rotting flesh and bone and had this terrible odor of rotting meat and death. In the officer's words himself, he said that this thing looked like a real-life horror movie prop from an undead movie but was actually moving around. It had long arms and massive claws at the end of each finger. It was staring into their eyes with an abnormally large mouth split open as if it was not trying to bear any of its teeth at all. The officers all fled the scene while this being began running alongside the cruiser, trying to keep up with them. Any other information about this night was blotted out and classified. Little is known about what happened to Michael F. or his current whereabouts or if he is even serving still as a police officer. If you would like your own police encounter stories to be featured on this post, please use the submission form available. We look forward to hearing more stories. It was on a hot summer night that I was out in the dark woods with my neighbor, whom I'm pretty close with. He was like extended family, honestly. The fact that I didn't even know we were going until that night when I was sitting at home in front of my laptop playing video games, my neighbor came over to see me and he asked me if I wanted to go camping with him and his family. It had been a while since we last did anything together, so of course I said yes. It would have just given us an excuse not to go to school for a couple of days. This was in September, so school had just started back up and the coldness of fall had not yet come, so it was perfect. The next day, his family and I gathered our camping gear. We're driving down a dark road with tall trees on the other side of it. It was getting dark quickly, so we had to turn the lights on, and unfortunately, which means we would have had to set up in the dark. So we're driving for about an hour or two, but it felt like it took forever. My friend's dad turned left at an unmarked intersection where there wasn't even a sign saying that this was the right turn off the road. The road got bumpy and rocky as he drove over this very raw, unpaved road. That's when we came across a large clearing because all I could see around was trees and darkness. Where we stopped at this makeshift campground, I say that because there was no clear indicated spot to set up a tent, a spigot, a bathroom or anything. This was truly camping just down the middle of nowhere. Perfect. Now I need to say that it was pitch blackout and it had gotten really cold now that the sun had set. We were also higher up in elevation. 
So we got everything set up quickly and decided we would huddle up in the tent together that my friend's father had set up for us. But I just had this feeling lingering within me that we weren't alone. Now my brain was playing tricks on me, so I decided to step out and get some fresh air. It was eerily quiet until I heard this screaming noise. My heart began pounding fast as if it knew what was coming. Then we heard a wrestling noise in the bushes, more screaming from the woods. I was so scared that my friend told me to come back into the tent. Now not only could we all hear the noises, but then as I got back in the tent and we shined our light, we could see something moving outside the tent, this shape. My friend's dad got a flashlight shining it too at this object. That's when this thing began screaming and thrashing. Now we're all yelling, freaking out because we can see the shape of this thing more. It looked like an animal, but all we could see was this large shape, and it was terrifying looking from the silhouette. It looked like an upright deformed reindeer or something, and it had long claws. It was where we being pranked. I wasn't even sure. It screamed again in our direction, and we just prayed for it to leave. It walked near our tent, and we all kept our flashlight shining at it through the tent material, only revealing its silhouette. But one thing I noticed is it never came closer to the tent. It's like it was pissed that we set up camp here in its area. I get it. This probably sounds like some sort of amateur creepy pasta, but tell it to my family, my friend's family, and me who have to deal with the memory of this thing. We stopped hearing it almost literally after we all pretty much urinated all over our sleeping bags out of terror. Surprisingly, none of us had any weapons on us. Somehow we all forgot. We got lucky that night, but who knows what would have happened if it were to come back and possibly check out our tent. Now, of course, my friend's dad regrets that he didn't bring any weapons. He forgot. He normally always carries a pistol. I went home the next day, and we didn't get any sleep that night. What was designed to be a civil day trip turned into a quick overnight terror. I've not been able to go camping since. I don't think I ever will, you know. And I'm also not sure what this thing was or where it came out of. I haven't really sat down to train research either. I don't really care. I just want to get rid of this memory. New York State is known for some pretty crazy things, from alligators and basements to criminals hiding behind trees. But I've had some pretty strange run-ins myself. I'll be telling you about my most interesting encounter yet. About a year ago, while on duty at a local town overnight for training, Myself and another officer were dispatched to a local residence for a report of an elderly woman gone missing while hiking with her dog on her own property. She was sitting on roughly 80 acres of land and couldn't have gone far. The person reporting was her son. He said she hadn't been there since later that afternoon when she set out with a dog towards the edge of the property near the swamp area by their house. It would have been odd to just send two officers on such a call, but due to our small force size, we were using one car on solo nights to provide better coverage across town. Upon arriving on scene, we met with the son, who led us down to where his mother was last seen. He told us he found her phone by their mailbox, which appeared that she had talked to her son for a little while, but after heading out had mentioned something about going towards the swamp as there were some wildflowers that had bloomed this time of year. This is why we had been dispatched as well. It also seemed like a good spot for bears, so we had to evaluate all the potential dangers. However, knowing how well populated our area was, not everybody always carried bear spray, but we did, so we could cover more ground efficiently and ensure safety if we came across any potentially dangerous wildlife. We walked for about 30 minutes following the path around to where I thought she may have gone towards. However, after walking for a little while longer, nothing turned up. We then decided to double back and try walking along another path that branched off from the one we were on to see if that would turn up any evidence that she had been here. 
While walking down this other path, at first it seemed like there was nothing out of the ordinary, but again no sign of her dog or any tracks leading to the brush, either finishing or somewhere else. This is when I began getting nervous because between myself and my partner, we could not find her or find any traces of her. Something must have happened to her since she left home earlier in the afternoon. As we kept going further, we began hearing odd noises in the distance. While I felt that we were safe at first, we both came to a sudden stop. These sounds were like nothing I've heard before, at least not on this side of the country. But it did not sound like any animal or person I could identify. Did you hear that? My partner had said to me as he looked towards the source of the howl. At this point, my heart was racing out of fear and curiosity, wanting more than anything for this night to end and for us to get back safely. I told him yes as my hands began to tremble slightly, for both nervousness and adrenaline. The hair on my arms were standing and raising, and I felt goosebumps beginning to form. We then slowly began moving towards where the howl had come from, both myself and my partner keeping our flashlights out just in case whatever made the noise was anything dangerous. We walked for another minute or so until we got closer and closer, still no sign of any dog tracks or even footprints, nothing leading up to this noise or away from it. My heart began pounding out of my chest when we came within about 30 feet of the origin of the sound, which had stopped by now after hearing us get closer. And then suddenly, without warning, an odd orb-like light appeared not too far above our heads, making us feel instantly nauseous. What is that? Hmm? I remember saying as I raised my flashlight to see what it was, but then just as quickly as it appeared, it vanished. My partner and myself both looked towards where the light disappeared, and then we heard a rustle from behind us, not too far away from where we were standing. Up until now, he whispered that we needed to get out of here. This wasn't right, but his voice quivered, which was strange and caught my attention. This was a partner who was always very calm, no matter how scary or dangerous the situation was. We had been working together for years. However, this time, he sounded scared, almost as if something else was out there, other than us. We began walking back towards where we came from for a while while I kept my light out in front of me just to make sure nothing was going to jump out. All the while, we had been hearing strange sounds that sometimes sounded like a human, but not fully, at least not having the cadence of a person. It was more animalistic. He would ask me again if I heard that, and I told him yes. He was getting more and more scared, even though his exterior was seemingly calm. We slowly started walking back towards where we came from where the sounds became louder and louder. This made it difficult to continue without completely freaking out on one another. Then, out of nowhere, the one sound that instantly made me stop in my tracks was the sound of some kind of human cry from not too far away. He whispered she to me as he looked at me with his eyes almost piercing right through mine. While I couldn't tell what it was, something compelled me to move forward so we could see what was making these strange sounds around us, which led us here in the first place. Wait, no, come back. We shouldn't be going up this far, he explained to me. But even though he seemed very insistent about us going back the way we came from, I couldn't bring myself to stay quiet and just go while we could still hear all these strange noises where we were. So... While he was busy whispering to me about how we should leave, I began walking towards where it sounded like this noise was coming from, which only made him try and stop me even more. We both proceeded to go deeper into the woods, but the sound of whatever we had heard was now gone, and it was silence. In fact, the night itself was now silent. The crickets, all night life, had gone completely dead, but the inside of my mind was going crazy, trying to figure out what was going on. What were those strange cries and noises? What were the bright lights that appeared overhead? But here's one of the strange parts. At some point, him and I lost each other, which I don't know how it's even possible, because we were walking within five to ten feet of one another. 
I hear him whispering into his radio, trying to contact me. But our radio communication was very fizzy, and somehow we had gotten separated. Joe, come in. Joe, are you out there? He kept saying over and over again, as I could hear what he was saying as if he was standing right next to me, even though we couldn't see each other at all. And as we're struggling in this disarray of a mess, this extremely bright white light shines from the sky, as if an asteroid had exploded up in the atmosphere, lighting up the entire night sky, enveloping me in, I assume, my partner, in this white consuming light. And the next thing you know, we're back at the front of the property, and it's morning time with the sun rising. The mom is sitting on her front porch with her dog, drinking coffee. She sees us and is immediately surprised. My partner and I are kind of looking at each other, freaking out, trying to mentally comprehend everything that has just happened. Feeling ourselves in our own heads and bodies, making sure we're not dead or dreaming. What just happened? I remember asking when the lady comes over to us and begins asking questions like, Where did you guys come from? Why are you here? We began asking her questions in return. Her name, was she aware that she was missing? She seemed to have no knowledge of her ever missing. And when checking the date and time, it had been about 14 hours since the previous evening. My partner and I can both vouch for this happening. I'll spare you all the new details, but long story short, after we had gotten separated by this very thick darkness, we were both enveloped in white light and somehow pushed through about 14 hours of time, ending up at the front of the property. At the time of this happening to us, it was roughly 8.36 p.m. at night, and we were no more than three, fourths of a mile away from the house. The woman who had been reported missing also showed no signs of ever being hurt or any recollection that she was ever missing in the first place. We did not report this as we have no logical way to explain anything that happened to us. I was on my way walking to the Dollar General store one early night in October 2016. I live west of Philadelphia in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. When I got ready to cross the street to where I was going, I noticed that there was a large black car, possibly an older Crown Victoria, parked on the side of the Dollar General store. The car had its interior lights on. As I walked closer, I could see someone in the driver's seat. The person had long black hair and had on sunglasses, so I couldn't see the person's eyes. As I looked closer, I could see that the person's face was really white, like milk white. It appeared that the person was just looking straight ahead and wasn't looking around. The person was moving a little bit, so it wasn't fake. I saw no mouth, no nose, and no facial hair. The face was just smooth white. I couldn't tell if they had ears because of their long black hair and shades. They were just parked and sitting there with the car interior light on as if they wanted to be seen for some reason. It's just weird how it just so happened to be at night when not many people were out as if it was planned that way. I was scared and creeped out. When I came out of the Dollar General, I went home. By walking all the way around the block to not pass that person, I'm saying person. It's more like being. It was scary and creepy. I first thought I was seeing things. I know I'm not the only person who has seen that. I never told anyone because I felt that people would think I was nuts. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but could this have been a so-called men in black? The entire scenario just didn't make any sense. One night I returned to my parents' house. I was still in my late teens, sober. On the side of the road, I noticed a man close to my mailbox wearing all white. At first, I thought it was a jogging suit. Then as I got closer, it seemed like he was dressed like Colonel Sanders. At the time, I lived on a dirt road with very few neighbors and thought it very odd to see somebody in white on a muddy road at about 9.30 at night. I kind of chuckled to myself. How odd, but I never even really made direct eye contact or got a great look at the guy. He appeared to be trying to back off the road to not get muddy when I drove by. 
My driveway was about 150 feet long through the woods, and I had just parked when I decided I should turn around and drive back down there and see if the gentleman needed help. I was thinking that it was very odd for somebody to be all in white on this muddy road, and maybe this guy needed help. Of course, by the time I drove back to the end of the driveway, he was gone. I drove by my neighbor's house, but it didn't look like anybody was home, and there's no way he could have made it any further than that. To this day, I don't know what or who that was. I was in Montana in the mountains near Melrose in the Buddy area. Me and my buddy had seen a herd of elk a couple days before and then saw them again along the mountain the next day as well. So we decided to head up a day or two after, to since we both had tags still. After a day of hunting and seeing nothing, we decided to split up and he would go walk down one side and I would walk another. We were going to meet back up at the truck. It's about five and dusk is starting to settle in, so I decided to head back. On my way down in the middle of the woods, I could hear this continuous sound, but I could tell what it was as I started to come around a bend. I could make out the faint sound of someone singing. I stopped to listen and was sure it was music, but I couldn't tell exactly where it was coming from. I continued to walk and was half expecting to run into another hunter listening to music. I went around a bend and could hear the music much louder. I was 100% sure it was a radio or something at this point. I walked a little bit farther and there was a battery-powered radio sitting on a downed tree. There was no one around. I decided not to hang around wondering about it and was pretty weirded out at this point, so I climbed over the log that the radio was on so as to keep going on my way. When I got over the log on the other side was a tipped-over box full of all different types of women's underwear and like half a dozen kids' dolls all arranged in a circle. The radio was an old tape player and had the same song over and over. I sped, walked my ass out of there till I was far enough away. Then I started running the rest of the way back. It was the weirdest shit ever. I always remembered the song playing, but didn't know what it was called till I heard it again a few years later. It was Skeeter Davis. The end of the world. I can't hear that song without getting chills now. Not that I often hear it. I was on shift at the county jail and had just gotten off of a patrol shift. My shift was supposed to end at 10, but I did not get off until midnight due to some court hearings that had just gotten out. I figured that I would have to go get something to eat and then hit the showers before going home since it wasn't worth trying to sleep in a dirty uniform. When everything is said and done, I head down to the lobby so I can clock out and leave after grabbing something quick to eat. There's this big glass window right behind where they make you sign in, so if there's any issue or if we need an update, when the day guys are coming in on shift, you can see all over the front desk through said window. I was about halfway through the lobby, my food already paid for, and trying to pick up something when I noticed something off in the corner window by the lockers where all of our gear is stored during shift changes. There's this big steel cabinet back there, and it, it's usually locked up pretty good, but it's also sort of old. You can tell if somebody has opened it. It sticks a tiny bit at the hinges. Now I've dealt with more than my fair share of gear in my short career at this point, so I already know what's supposed to be in that closet just by looking at it. There are two desks, backpacks, tactical vests, and even rifles on occasion. Well, when I saw the cabinet open and the guns were over there instead of over here where they should have been, I got a little concerned. The guys at the front desk heard me asking who was in the locker room. One of them came out to see what was wrong. He checked it out, completely confused by what he knew for a fact, that nobody had come in since us day guys started clocking out at this time. We closed up shop and decided to head back down until we could figure things out. I would later find out that my other officers had seen a police officer they did not recognize moving things around, which would later be known as the ghost. But luckily enough, my gun was still in its case, sitting on top of my locker. 
So if nothing else, nothing was missing for me personally, which is a huge relief considering each gun gets locked up with its own special key, and there's only like six of those in the entire station. I was talking to one of the guys at the front desk about what I'd seen, the ghost, the apparition, but he did not remember anybody coming through for a while, so he went back down together to talk to the night watchman. After all this happened, I guess he too has seen this apparition as well. It will come in and move things around, everything from paperwork to equipment. And this is coming from somebody who doesn't believe in ghosts at all, but there's definitely something here. Now, our county jail is pretty small, maybe around 40 cells if I had to guess, but it also has an upper level that houses some offices and the conference room, along with holding cells where you could put somebody before transfer or just until their court date. The lower floor houses two large interview rooms, six normal cell blocks, an infirmary that doubles as a psychiatric unit, and then our holding area for everybody else that needs to stay the night. I had gone up there with our main dispatcher and her assistant after talking to the guys at the front desk. Every single door was locked like they should have been aside from one solitary cell that houses an older woman who'd been picked up for public intoxication just earlier that evening. That just made no sense whatsoever, of course, unless she escaped, and I have no idea because it would take quite a struggle to break out of those doors since we're talking about solid steel. The cells also have two deadbolts on top both being locked, so you have to do three things prior to breaking through, all of them which is nearly impossible if unarmed or alone unless you can pick locks. The cops that were there at the time had gone through just about every inch of this place, coming up with virtually nothing, which is extremely strange. We're a very small team, and we could usually get a pretty good bead on these things before it gets too far. It was only the three of us, after all, and we made sure to check out everything together in case something or somebody had slipped by. We even went over our entire walkie-talkie system just to make sure there was nothing going on. But we were also noticing we were having a lot of static issues, which is very unusual. The air felt very electric. Blah! Lots of magnetism in the air. Again, very unusual. And from the watchman, he always explained how the air would seem to change every time he would see this thing on the cameras, this officer ghost. But after searching for what seemed like hours, we decided to head back down and see if maybe something else had popped up, or perhaps there'd be some kind of clue lying around somewhere that could explain all of this without having to call in everybody else just yet. It seemed that maybe this was an inside job. I'm also trying to think rationally here and not immediately go to ghosts. The only people who had access to that room were either on shift or had clocked out at this point. But it doesn't explain why somebody would take or move our stuff and then not bother using it for whatever they wanted to do with it. I don't know if you've ever worked with law enforcement before. But having guns missing is a really bad thing. If they fell into the wrong hands, there's literally nothing stopping them from being used against anybody, including our other officers. Our vests are also equipped with Kevlar plates, despite how light they may be, so those could seriously injure or even kill somebody, which again is an extreme risk since most of us carry them around everywhere we go. I tried talking to the watchman again who didn't remember anybody else coming in but informed me that on camera he saw the figure multiple times this evening. I just couldn't buy it, though. If you know anything about our tiny town, you might know we don't have a ton going on, especially at night, which is why most people end up getting bored and find crime to commit. Even officers have a struggle of keeping responsibility or they can't handle the stress that comes with law enforcement. I hate watering the idea of this entire thing down to a silly ghost or apparition, or even acknowledging the fact that this police station is haunted. But maybe it's time to open my mind. The night watchman, a good friend of mine, is a no-nonsense kind of guy. He wouldn't make this stuff up. 
I don't know if he really believes in ghosts, but he's definitely seeing something on the cameras that isn't quite human. I was patrolling my usual forest trails at night. I've been a ranger for eight years now, and nothing had ever scared me as much as this one experience that I encountered. Well, what I think was a Bigfoot. Doing my routine patrol on this night, it all started with me walking along the same trail I do at night to do my rounds. Being Florida, it had rained earlier in the day, so everything was calm and peaceful, minus the puddles of mud here and there. The sun had set about an hour or two before, which meant it was exceptionally dark outside. Although I was already used to this, the moon was barely out. I saw a few other rangers patrolling with me, but they had passed by, and somewhere out of nowhere, maybe about thirty minutes later, I was walking along the dirt trail when I noticed something appeared in front of me. A dark, large figure coming from the right side of the path and then crossing in front of me as it headed off into some thick brush off to my left, Palmetto's. Actually, this is directly where I patrol, meaning there should most definitely not be anything even remotely close to resembling whatever this thing was. Its speed is what surprised me and took me off guard, considering it didn't even give me enough time to turn around and see what it looked like. All I could make out was that it was jet black, very tall and easily taller than I was. It moved quickly. I didn't even have time to react until laughter had already gone into the bushes disappearing as quickly as it had appeared, deep in the palmettos. My heart sunk, and I felt an odd sensation. It was this incredible feeling of fear. All I can think about is how much more dangerous it had just made my job that night. If there was some large animal out here that moved fast, was taller than I, and larger than I, that actually crossed paths with me like it did, what else might be lurking on here? Would it cross paths with me again? Was this thing actually looking for me? As I thought about it more, I consider the fact that if something was after me, then maybe whatever it was might be prepared to attack. Although I wasn't going to back down without a fight, I began getting angry. Maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, but I was a few hours away from my shift ending and talking myself into returning to the station, telling myself that if I did, I would be safe. If this thing is out there, it's just as much looking for me as it is anybody else. So now more than ever, getting to my ranger station was my only priority. I didn't really know what it was or what to think about it, but there was only one way to find out, and that was by continuing my patrol. Now I stood still for a moment, debating with myself on whether or not I should continue. Remembering all the times going back home early, it made me feel like a failure. Although I had never encountered anything like this before, it didn't mean there's nothing out there. It only means that whatever it was hadn't bothered me yet. But now that it had crossed paths with me, I might be next on this list of things to kill. Music that would have made me sick. The rest of my story is pretty uneventful, unfortunately. After this, not a lot happened. I didn't see the figure again, and as I look back on this event and reflect, I believe I encountered a skunk ape, the Bigfoot native to the Florida Everglades. While it was probably harmless and didn't want to actually hurt or kill me, it was still completely terrifying. I still don't know if this creature was real or not, but that didn't matter. Regardless of what it actually is, I'm convinced that whatever it was, it wanted to hurt me, or so I had convinced myself and still wonder. I'm from California, and I was in the northeastern corner of North Carolina the day before Thanksgiving visiting a friend. While visiting, I set out for a casual stroll to take in some of this beautiful country. There was an old church with a huge cemetery behind it, featuring graves from the 1800s and beyond. I took the road north and walked down to an old wooden bridge that crossed the creek that snaked alongside the road. I thought the bridge would be private because the dirt lane on the other side led down to someone's house. But then I noticed a fire road to the left that corkscrewed up the side of the densely wooded hillside that was my route. It was steep, 
but the air was cool and it felt good to get some exercise. I was about halfway up and I noticed an old car salvage yard in the open meadow below me, right across the road from the old church. About thirty paces later, I got a strange feeling that let me know that I was being watched. So I took two more steps up the hill and heard something sprinting across the top of that hill, away from my location, but it was not the general prance like that of a deer. Rather, these steps were deliberate, heavy, and lightning fast. Then there was the sound of the breaking of a large branch or a small tree. It then got deathly quiet for a few moments. I cautiously took two more steps. Then I heard faint, calculated steps around the crest of the hilltop back in my direction. That strange feeling returned with a vengeance. I froze in my tracks. I was carrying a sidearm. I could hear my heartbeat in the silence. I scanned the topography of the hilltop, staring from where I heard the tree break from left to my right, high and low, searching for the slightest of movement. I was a sitting duck. I just had my back to whatever had the drop on me. Then I saw it, just the upper half of a head that was the same color as the two pines it was hiding behind. The rest of the body was concealed by the large underbrush in front. It was as still as those two pine trees. The top of the head was rounded, and the eyes were black as coal. The eye size was out of a fifty-cent piece and about five inches apart. I don't know how long I stared at this thing, but I do remember thinking, what the hell am I looking at? Then it hit me. That has got to be a Bigfoot. Well, that's enough for me, I thought, and back down the hill I went. I heard a minor disturbance in the leaves, and it was all over. I have no doubt in my mind that if that Bigfoot wanted me, he certainly could have had me. Fortunately for me, he or she was just curious. The strangest thing about this encounter is that I had no recollection of this event until several years later. My memory shook loose by reading someone else's encounter. I feel incredulous by this fact and can only resolve it as a repressed memory brought on by a traumatic event. I have read hundreds of encounters and listened to lots of testimonies as well, and feel fortunate that I was able to eventually recall the encounter. Folks, I know this might be hard to believe, but it's what I've gone through. I had just finished up with a traffic stop one night where all I found was an expired registration on a car, which did not match the plates. So I let them off without warning, went back to my cruiser to call dispatch before returning to patrol. This being said, I should have been able to see everything in front of me as clear as day, even though it was winter time and where all the trees had lost their leaves, so visibility shouldn't have been too much of an issue. My headlights illuminated almost anything within 100 yards or so, but sometimes things can hide in the shadows of those yards. I noticed something out of my peripheral vision. This is right as I was on the phone with dispatch, so I immediately cut off dispatch and began slowly driving towards where I saw whatever it was, thinking it was a person up to no good. But then I saw that it moved slowly and had a long, fluid stride. Despite having no leaves, it seemed to blend in with the surroundings enough that you could just barely make out what it looked like when I saw a large head, two long ears, and horns, dark, deep eye sockets that appeared almost hollow, taken up by most of my headlights' illumination. By this point, I felt like Alice chasing after whatever. Alice chased after into Wonderland, except without all the trippiness and trying to find an exit. Except this time, it was the one chasing after me. I sped up a bit and tried to keep it in sight. But as I got closer, it suddenly crouched down, and I lost sight of it. The more I go into detail about this experience, the deeper things get. Just know that there is no car for it to have gotten into or jump over any fence. So where did it go, whatever it was? But as soon as you stop asking questions is when they get answered. So I slowly circled around the same 100 yards again, searching for anything unusual with my high beams on, on full illumination. It must have been hiding from me somehow. There was nothing except a few stray cats starting behind some trash cans on the other side of the street. I jumped some bushes and parked cars. Still nothing. 
So I start to just go back on duty, probably looking like a crazy officer driving around aimlessly for no reason. But that's what we do sometimes in this job. You just never know when something is going to pop out, so better be safe than sorry. I'm about halfway down the block towards my car when suddenly up ahead of me, which is now being obstructed by tall grass, I see it again. It had been crouched down again, but its head was now tilted upward at an angle directly towards me, and its mouth was wide open. There were no teeth visible that I could recall, and it did not appear to be making any sounds. It would only remain in that position for a few seconds. Then it would slowly move from side to side before standing back up on its two legs. It was at least ten yards away from me, so I did the sensible thing, which was to get back into my car, lock the doors. But it just stood there, looking at me for a few seconds, until going back behind some other parked cars, trying to keep out of sight. I don't know what it wanted with me, but it, if you have watched any cop show or horror movie ever, you probably could have guessed what happened next. I got out of my vehicle, drew my firearm. I'm smart enough to realize that shooting them never works anyway, but as I was about to approach the spot where it had been standing, it suddenly appeared in front of me, stopped and stared at me. And dang it, this thing was fast. It did not make any noise, but its wide-open, gaping mouth, which now I can see contained what looked like rows of jagged teeth, glistening with drool. Then it runs away from me again. I followed right behind it. At this point, I just really wanted to know what this thing was, so forget being scared. I probably should have just gone back into my car for that hour or two remaining of my shift, but there's a reason why they call it being stupid anyway. So I'm chasing after whatever it was, and I'm running pretty fast, but not jumping over anything. This thing was fast, like Usain Bolt fast. It did not even run in a straight line. When it ran away from me, it would just kind of weave in and out of any obstacle in front of it, which consistently mostly apart cars or trash at the time. But when you move so much while trying to evade capture, eventually you're going to fall down. Your legs can only take you so far before they get tired. That's what I think happened in this thing. It seemed to collapse on something that was invisible in my headlights and then pulls itself back up, which I'm not sure if it tripped or why it collapsed. Maybe it was feigning death. I don't know. But as soon as it pulled itself back up, it runs into a nearby backyard, which made sense. I mean, all the streets have been blocked off at this point. So, I'm going chasing after it to the same gate that is still wide open in the fence. And to my horror, I see another similar creature on my left, staring right at me like an idiot while not making any noise. It too was crouched down like something out of a prehistoric paleo zoo exhibit. Its mouth agape, but I couldn't see any teeth. I couldn't help but notice that this one had very large eyes, much larger than the other one, almost like a child or a baby compared to an adult. And then another creature just took off running, while I was still trying to figure out if this creature was real or not, or was I simply running after a nightmare? And then a smaller one jumps right in front of me. Out of reaction, I shoot this one point blank in the chest several times, which my gun did not even seem to phase it. It kept on running towards me, and I panicked at this point. Despite my training, I'm now thinking that this is some kind of demon. I did not even bother shooting at it again. The first few shots seemed to have no effect. So instead of wasting bullets, I pulled out my taser and tased whatever it was, expecting it to fall over. But it did not even react. The taser did nothing. Unsure of what to do at this point, I do the only thing I know I can do. Run. This creature and the other two gave chase following quickly behind each other. I made it back to my cruiser and flew out of there, and since this night I have never seen or dealt with such a creature. But I believe that this was something that had come from deep in the pits of hell, and I know these things are very real. I've thought about this incident nearly every day for the past 20 years and still don't know exactly what happened. 
I believe I experienced a rip in the space-time continuum, or some other less cliché version of that. All I know is that one moment the sky was blue and the next second it was night. We were staying at my grandmother's house in rural Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, during the summer. When I was a kid, I loved going to my grandma's because it was so different from my life in Philadelphia. So we'd been there for over a week at this point. I just needed to get out of the house. There was a small creek that divided the woods from the property, and there was a thick tree branch that stretched across the brook so I could use that to hop over the water, and then also use some big rocks as additional stepping stones. I got over the stream and to the woods. I just meandered about. Many years previous, my brother and I had built a tree house, so I decided I would go and try to find it to see if it was still standing. I walked about five minutes into the woods and reached the large oak that once held our makeshift treehouse. Not surprisingly, it was a total wreck, and I decided that I'd be foolish to climb up there. So instead, I just started to turn around and walk back to the house. When I reached the creek, this time there was this faint white glow coming from the water. I thought it was weird looking back on it, but just figured that it was probably the angle of the sun or something. I mean, the water looked normal except for the edges and the ripples, almost shined and sparkled in the light. It's sort of hard to explain. Also, the stream was moving more quickly than usual, but not flooding or anything, so I had no clue why something like this would be happening. I just started to hop my way over the rocks and onto the branch bridge, but when my foot touched the far bank, I felt a flash of light overtake my vision, and I fell flat on the ground. When I opened my eyes again, I thought I'd gone blind. I honestly wondered if I had hurt my eyes somehow. The world had fallen into complete darkness, even though it couldn't have been even half past two in the afternoon. I managed to get myself back on my feet and made my way back to the house. Luckily, I knew the property well, and I made it there without incident. I flung open the door, and there stood my mother and my grandmother in the kitchen. The look on their faces were frightening. I'd never seen them with such serious expressions. My grandmother was on the phone with the police, and my brother was sitting quietly on the couch. His head spun as soon as I opened the door. I could tell by looking at everybody's faces that they had all been crying. Their cheeks were streaked and their eyes were red. My mom then asked me where I'd been and said I knew I wasn't allowed to be gone that long. Apparently, I'd been gone for hours. I watched as her face moved between anger and being relieved to see me alive. I couldn't understand it at first because I'd only just walked five minutes into the woods. But they said they had searched and called my name and went down to the creek, but they never saw any signs of me. Nothing. I still don't know what happened, but I do believe that I somehow was caught in a time warp. There's no other explanation that's reasonable for what happened except for something supernatural. I couldn't have fallen or gotten lost because my family searched the area. They would have seen me. I didn't go far. They would have literally had to step over my body if they were in the area of that creek. It's just impossible that I was near where they were looking and not in some otherworldly place. Still, none of them believed me, and my mom was always very adamant that I do not share my story with teachers and friends. Since then, I realized that I wasn't alone in this experience after watching various videos and reading other accounts, but I'm still looking for answers. I can't easily go back there to check it out, because my grandmother ended up passing away a few years ago, and after that, my family sold the property. I'm eventually going to contact them and see if I can go back and find answers. When I was a little kid, my mom was out of town and I was with my dad at our house. Our house was on a remote Indian reserve in Canada and about three miles away was my grandparents' house. Our houses were separated by three large wheat fields surrounded by forest. I don't know why, but my dad got me ready at nighttime and we started walking on the gravel road to my grandparents' house. My mom had the vehicle with her. I was under the age of five and pretty small girl. 
I remember it was a clear autumn night. The wheat fields were a few weeks from being harvested, and there was a bright full moon. There wasn't a single vehicle running in miles. We started hearing something following us. It was in the ditch in the tall grass and in the wheat field. My dad held my hand as he grabbed some stones off the gravel road. He started hurling rocks into the ditch. It would run off and then start following us again. He grabbed more stones and put them in his pocket, then put me on his shoulders. I remember holding onto his forehead when I was sitting on his shoulders, and it was all sweaty. I wasn't scared. I was getting excited every time I spotted that thing. I could see a lot better from way up, and I could see the thing's back or shoulders moving through the grass. I'd point it out to my dad, and then he'd throw more stones at it. It kept on coming back. To make matters creepier, we took a shortcut that was along the forest line on a thin dirt road. My dad started whistling loudly for my grandparents' German shepherd, Boss. The house was still far away, but we could hear Boss barking and moving towards us. Whatever that was following us was still following us. That dog was such a welcoming sight to see, sniffed around both of us for a moment, then dashed off into the field barking like mad. We got to my grandparents' house. My dad told my grandparents. I fell asleep on the couch. I talked to my dad about it many years later. He said after that they had smudged. My grandparents and father believe in the old ways and think maybe it was some bad medicine spirit and prayed for protection. Whatever it was, I was the target. Predators always go for the youngest or oldest. I was patrolling my usual forest trails at night. I've been a ranger for eight years now, and nothing had ever scared me as much as this one experience that I encountered. Well, what I think was a Bigfoot. Doing my routine patrol on this night, it all started with me walking along the same trail I do at night to do my rounds. Being Florida, it had rained earlier in the day, so everything was calm and peaceful, minus the puddles of mud here and there. The sun had set about an hour or two before, which meant it was exceptionally dark outside, although I was already used to this. The moon was barely out. I saw a few other rangers patrolling with me, but they had passed by. And somewhere out of nowhere, maybe about thirty minutes later, I was walking along the dirt trail when I noticed something appeared in front of me. A dark, large figure coming from the right side of the path and then crossing in front of me as it headed off into some thick brush off to my left. Tall meadows. Actually, this is directly where I patrol, meaning there should most definitely not be anything even remotely close to resembling whatever this thing was. Its speed is what surprised me and took me off guard, considering it didn't even give me enough time to turn around and see what it looked like. All I could make out was that it was jet black, very tall, and easily taller than I was. It moved quickly. I didn't even have time to react until laughter had already gone into the bushes, disappearing as quickly as it had appeared, deep in the palmettos. My heart sunk, and I felt an odd sensation. It was this incredible feeling of fear. All I could think about is how much more dangerous it had just made my job that night. If there was some large animal out here that moved fast, was taller than I, and larger than I, that actually crossed paths with me like it did, what else might be lurking on here? Would it cross paths with me again? Was this thing actually looking for me? As I thought about it more, I considered the fact that if something was after me, then maybe whatever it was might be prepared to attack. Although I wasn't going to back down without a fight, I began getting angry. Maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, but I was a few hours away from my shift ending and talking myself into returning to the station, telling myself that if I did, I would be safe. If this thing is out there, it's just as much looking for me as it is anybody else. So now, more than ever, getting to my ranger station was my only priority. I didn't really know what it was or what to think about it, but there was only one way to find out, and that was by continuing my patrol. 
Now I stood still for a moment, debating with myself on whether or not I should continue, remembering all the times going back home early had made me feel like a failure. Although I had never encountered anything like this before, it didn't mean there's nothing out there. It only means that whatever it was hadn't bothered me yet, but now that it had crossed paths with me, I might be next on this list of things to kill. That would have made me sick. The rest of my story is pretty uneventful, unfortunately. After this, not a lot happened. I didn't see the figure again, and as I look back on this event and reflect, I believe I encountered a skunk ape, a Bigfoot native to the Florida Everglades. While it was probably harmless and didn't want to actually hurt it or kill me, it was still completely terrifying. I still don't know if this creature was real or not, but that didn't matter. Regardless of what it actually is, I'm convinced that whatever it was, it wanted to hurt me. Or so I had convinced myself and still wonder. had the lookout watch on the bow of a tall ship at three or so on a clear night. Beautiful sailing weather, calm seas, could see every star, etc. You basically have binoculars and look at the water ahead of the ship, making little circles from the horizon towards the ship, then looking to the right, doing the same, moving all the way around the ship, with frequent looks ahead to make sure nothing's in your way. As I was doing this, I eventually got to looking behind the ship where I saw a huge cloud of smoke coming off the horizon, and it was lit up orange, like a ship had exploded in a huge fireball. There was nothing else around the cloud in the sky or the water. I estimated it to be just over the horizon, eight miles. I hurriedly called to the bridge and reported some sort of fireball or explosion. As the office of the deck was checking it out, the smoke moved to the side, and then the moon started to rise. I was looking at the moon rise, and it was very orange since the moon was on the horizon, and there was one single wispy cloud in front of it. The cloud was backlit by this orange moon. The effect only lasted for a few seconds. If I had scanned that section a few seconds before, or a few seconds later, I would have seen some part of the moon, and and maybe a little cloud next to it. But they just happened to line up right when I looked. Then there was a time I heard a she, devil banshee howl around the same time in the morning, while I was the office of the deck on another ship. Never figured out what that was. Don't care to. I worked as a park ranger. So one night I received a distress call about a group of hikers who had become trapped in an uncharted section of the deep forest. Determined to find them, I set out on patrol, equipped with my flashlight and a compass. The darkness enveloped the trees, casting eerie shadows that danced with every gust of wind. As I made my way along the trail, my heart pounded in anticipation. The hikers had reported their approximate location, and I focused on following their path. But as I ventured deeper into the forest, a strange feeling washed over me, a feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a figure appeared in the distance. My heart skipped a beat as I strained my eyes to see. As I drew closer, my breath caught in my throat. It was a creature I had never encountered before. It resembled a Sasquatch, but its thick red hair and deep, piercing, human-like eyes set it apart. I called out, my voice echoing through the trees, demanding answers. But the creature simply disregarded me and disappeared into the dense woods, leaving me stunned and filled with an inexplicable mixture of awe and confusion. What had I just witnessed? Was it truly a Bigfoot or merely an elaborate prank? Shaking off the encounter, I continued my search for the lost hikers. Their safety was my primary concern, and I pushed myself to navigate through the labyrinth of trees and underbrush. The sounds of rustling leaves and distant animal calls intensified my determination. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, I, I stumbled upon the hikers. They were exhausted and frightened, but relieved to see me. I quickly reassured them and guided them back towards the safety of the established trails. 
As I led them out of the wilderness, my mind remained fixated on the creature I had encountered earlier. Once the hikers were safe, I took a moment to reflect. What was the true nature of the creature I'd seen? I wanted to ask whether someone may have an explanation to what I could have encountered. I was walking home from work yesterday after dusk, yet it was still somewhat light outside, as during these times in Denmark, the light persists for quite long and at three separate occasions encountered or heard something strange that I cannot fully comprehend or explain logically. The first one was a 50 centimeter tall, guesstimate shadowy or dark bipedal figure running at high speed away from me, which I only saw in the corner of my eye and did not pay much attention to. Three hundred meters further I saw what at first appeared to be human in dark clothes, walking around twenty, thirty meters in front of me, but when I took a better look it seemed like it was just legs up to around knee, height. After I realized what I have seen and could not make any logical conclusion of it, it turned to the left and walked through a tree line, after which it seemed to have switched to four legs and disappeared by the time I walked, where it had been standing previously. What's even weirder is the fact that there is nowhere to hide in that area, and I had clear vision of where it should have gone, and even checked where it went into the tree line. It vanished. At this point, I felt eerie and creeped out, as there usually are not many people walking around, but it happens, though they always stay fully visible and never disappear. The third time was almost at my house door, where I have heard rustling and movements in bushes where cats usually hide, but they don't make such loud noises. The thing that I saw disappear into the tree line somewhat resembled a Fresno nightcrawler but it had human legs and was dark, black, shadowy. This was in Copenhagen metropolitan area, if it helps anyhow. I paddled about 240 miles up a river in Canada a few years back. It gets to a point where you end up being completely alone in the wild with no civilization to be found anywhere so we had a couple of interesting encounters. Both of the ones that really stick out happened at night. One of the first nights we're out there, I'm sleeping in my tent, comfy as can be. All of a sudden I feel a big snout poking my head through the tent and sniffing. I didn't know what it was and that it dawned on me. A black bear got curious and decided to sniff around the campsite and he ended up sniffing my face for like three minutes. I didn't want to move because I didn't want to startle him, so I was just lying there as this bear sticks his nose in my face and starts huffing. I swear I almost shit myself. The second encounter had the potential to be scary, but I was too busy stifling laughter to really feel fear. One of the last nights we were out there, we decided to set up camp on a little beach. It seemed like a good spot, but after we set up camp, I'm walking around and I notice some moose tracks in the sand. We had set up camp on a little moose watering hole. No big deal. I'm sleeping in my tent and I hear heavy footprints outside. Sick, a moose. Cool beans. I slowly open my tent zipper as quiet as possible so I wouldn't scare the thing. I'm super excited to see my first moose. Except I didn't see the moose. At least not the whole thing. All I saw was this bull's giant dick dangling down, maybe three feet in front of my face. I recently moved into a new home. Since moving here, I've felt my entire bed vibrating, low frequency, moderate amplitude, nothing like a phone vibration. More like driving five miles per hour over rumble strips on a highway, but silent three times now. My partner was over one night and woke me up to ask why the bed was vibrating because they felt it. I did too at that point. And I was just like, I don't know. Maybe the train that is about a mile away was just the right mass and speed to induce a resonance in the hill my home is on. But that's all I can come up with. 
Hasn't happened in a couple of months, but I keep waiting for it to happen so I can run outside to see if I can hear the train and confirm the hypothesis. I have checked seismograph records online and came up with nothing. The frequency and amplitude of the vibrations don't seem to correspond to anything, so the train thing is all I've got. The floor isn't vibrating when this is occurring, making it even more strange. There are no major roads and no construction for miles. No underground drainage here, either, since I'm in the county. I have an Ikea bed frame with the drawers under it, and no, there are no vibrating toys in them. Only clothing. Any ideas? This is an account of an incident that happened in 1974 when I was 15 years old living in the city of Puebla, Mexico with my family. On this day, my younger sister Janet, she was 14, her best friend Shay, also an American living in Puebla, and I were gathering in the afternoon so we could take a bus together to the city of Kalula to make clay for art class. While Janet and I were walking around the block to pick up Shay at her house, we saw an American man appearing to be in his mid to late thirties, walking in the opposite direction of us on the other side of the street. He was carrying a large duffel bag over his shoulder. Janet and I started speaking loudly in English, hoping we would get his attention, but to no avail. When we arrived at Shay's house, we insisted that she hurry for the possibility of catching up with that guy. By the time she was finally ready, we were sure we would have missed him, but instead he was in the same place where we saw him last. We already told Shay about this guy, and after seeing him now and walking in the same direction, we all spoke up loudly in English, hoping again to get his attention. This time it worked. From across the street he yelled to us, Do you speak English? He crossed the street to the side we were on and told us he was looking for a specific address, taking out a piece of paper where the address was written and showing it to us. We did not recognize the street name. It was a long Aztec name beginning with the letter T. Since we were on the Uakiasen Street, he thought the street we were on was the same street, but it was not. We decided to walk him to the house number on Tehuacan Street that he had on his paper. While walking to that address, each of us would think different things, especially lots of questions, and he would look at each of us and answer our thoughts out loud. He was reading our minds. For instance, I thought to myself, I wonder what his name is, and he would look at me and reply, Richard. Janet said she was wondering where he was from, and he turned to Janet and just said Santa Barbara, California. Of course I didn't know why he looked at Janet and said that, but I was catching on quickly to understand that he read our minds, as none of us said a word, and he just answered our thought questions while facing the person who had the thought. At one point he looked directly at Shay and said that she shouldn't worry about Jane, Shay's boyfriend, and that he, Jane, wouldn't be jealous. Later, Shay said she was worried about what Jane might think about the situation of joining this attractive guy. We arrived at the house that had that number he had on his paper. It was in the direction of where we were going to catch the bus to Cholula. Because he did not know any Spanish, we spoke with a maid who answered the door at that house. The maid said that this was not the house he was looking for, and the people who lived there were not the people Richard was looking for, and she closed the door. Richard continued addressing our thoughts, and after the door closed, I said out loud, Hey, we probably have a map at our house. It was an apartment, and could find the address from there. As you might have gathered by now, we, Shay Janet and I, abandoned the journey to Chalula to, to make clay. Everyone agreed that this was a good idea, so we turned back and walked to our apartment. Once there, Richard, Shay, and Janet were joined at the dining room table by my sister, Louise, the eldest of us three. Our maid, Anya, met Richard, as did my mother and Anna and later my mother, pulled me aside and chased me for bringing a stranger to our home. When my mother confronted me, I replied that she wasn't living her Christian values if she thought it was all right to put a person out who needed help. I sometimes was a sassy kid. It turned out we didn't have a map at our home. 
so I ran around the apartment building asking neighbors if they had one. No one did. I went to the ground floor beauty shop and asked the ladies in there, and no one had one, nor had they heard of the street. One beautician suggested we take a bus, and before getting on, ask the bus driver if they knew the street, because, she said, bus drivers know the city, and her street's best. All the time I was running around, Richard, both my sisters, Louise and Janet, Shay, and my mother were sitting around the round dining room table. I would stop by periodically to give them updates. During one of these updates, I noticed that Richard had poured out a bunch of salt from the salt shaker in front of him. He had formed a pyramid, complete with four flat sides and a pointed top. I remember looking at that and thinking it was odd, but was more focused on trying to find a map for Richard. Later, Anna commented to me that he was rude to make such a mess on the table with the salt. Since no one in the building had a map, we took the advice of going to a bus stop and asking a bus driver about the address. We went to the bus stop that was around the corner on the street where Shay lived and where we first found Richard. That bus stop was across the street from a park that normally was crowded with people, but was totally empty when we got there. Richard, Shay, Janet, and I waited at that corner for the buses. Buses in a Mexican city are plentiful, and they would come by about every five minutes or so. When the buses arrived and stopped, I took the written address and asked the bus driver if they knew the street. Five buses went by in all. A couple of the bus drivers replied that if the spelling and the name were changed, they might know the street, while all the others said there was no such street. I had thought that I would continue with Richard to his destination. As I have said before, he was attractive. In a little bit, you will see why this is significant. After the fifth bus left, we stood there quietly. Shay, Janet, and I were facing Richard in the empty park behind him, while Richard was facing the opposite way, with his back to the park. His duffel bag was on the ground next to him. We were all silent, and then suddenly, poof, in a split second, a large old-time taxi, looking bomb of a car, appeared right before our eyes. No engine sound, facing the wrong direction on a one-way street, and just behind Richard, we, Shay, Janet, and I were totally flabbergasted, breathless, in total shock. The car appeared old, with a splotchy green paint job, light green, with faded areas here and there. Directly after it appeared, a man who looked and sounded exactly like Alfred Hitchcock, seated in the driver's seat and having his elbow out the open window, resting his arm there, said, Young man, are you looking for a T-Street? He said the exact name of the street that no one had heard of before. His voice was totally Alfred Hitchcock's voice, too. Immediately, Richard picked up his duffel bag, turned around, and said, Yes, I am. At that, Alfred Hitchcock closed his hands together, as in prayer, then opened them with a map opening between his hands. He said to Richard, This is where we are, and this is where we're going, pointing out the places on the map. Richard was leaning towards Alfred Hitchcock and getting this information, and they continued talking to each other. Shay leaned against the car to catch her breath as we were all so blown away by the car and Alfred Hitchcock's appearance. Janet sharply told Shay to stop leaning on the car, because if it disappeared like it appeared, she would be flat on her back in the street. Shay stopped leaning. At about that point, Richard picked up his duffel bag, walked around the front of the car, threw his duffel bag in the car, and right before he got in the passenger seat, looked at me and asked, Don't you want to come? I said in an emphatic, No. He said, Okay, got in the seat, and then the car, with no engine motor sounds, turned the corner toward Shay's house, and while it was turning, Alfred Hitchcock said loudly to us, Have a nice trip, see you in the funny papers. I had never before had heard the expression of see you in the funny papers. As soon as the car straightened onto the street, the car with Alfred Hitchcock and Richard in it disappeared immediately as quickly as it had first shown up. We, Shay, Janet, and I were so freaked out that we all started running towards our home in a frantic state, but at one point we all stopped, gathered together, kind of hugging each other. 
and feeling like deer in headlights. When we were together like that, we heard all around us, especially above us, Alfred Hitchcock's voice laughing and laughing. After a minute or two of that low, sinister laugh, it stopped and we felt released and ran on. For the past, almost, 50 years, I've kept my eyes open to anything that might explain the incident. Janet and I have told the story through the years. We have not been in touch with Shay, so I don't know if she has spoken of it since we all left Mexico. I've asked many people what they thought, and only once, when I went to a seance that a friend had organized, did the medium tell me it was an alien abduction. When I explained the experience to her, after she did a reading of the group, that never felt right to me, but I don't know. In 2008, I ran across a Reuters article on the torture of sleep deprivation that shamed our country in Gitmo with terrorist prisoners. I was teaching Introduction to Psychology in a course called The Psychology of Dreams at our nearby university, so I read much about sleep, dreams, and the effect sleep deprivation has on the psyche. The article was about the sleep deprivation of Bin Laden's driver, Salim Hamdan. The article described how Hamdan was tortured by being deprived of sleep for 50 days. I read on and was blown away when I read two paragraphs in that article that stood out for me. The first read, they also said the records indicated Hamdan and other prisoners at the remote detention camp in southeastern Cuba were visited by someone called Alfred Hitchcock, apparently over the British master of psychological thriller films who died in 1980. Later in the article, under the heading, who was Alfred Hitchcock, it read defense lawyers said they were curious about the meaning of entries in the documents that Alfred Hitchcock had visited Hamdan and other prisoners. Who Alfred Hitchcock is, I have no idea, said Navy Lieutenant Commander Brian Miser. A defense lawyer, it's obviously a code. Name for something. I have not found any further strange information about Alfred Hitchcock, but the incident that happened to us happened in 1974, and Alfred Hitchcock was alive at that time. I don't think I ever thought it was the real Alfred Hitchcock, nor a ghost of one, but a duplicate in some strange way. This entire incident was experienced by my sister, Janet, her friend, Shay, and me, while several other witnesses were a part of the experience at certain points. My older sister, Louise, my mother, and our maid, Anna, met Richard and witnessed some of his strange behaviors, reading minds and making a pyramid out of salt. I would just like to know if anyone out there has any idea what it may have been about. I had most of my out-of-science experiences there in Puebla, and I've always wondered if it is a place where magical types of things happen. Even when I go back to visit my older sister, nephew and his family, I have strange things happen, so I don't think it was a thing of youth, but rather a place that is interesting to me. I am a licensed professional counselor, LPCS, an educator in Texas with three master's degrees. My sister Janet is a veterinarian and a paramedic here in Texas, and my sister Louise has a PhD and teaches at a university in Mexico. I think we could be considered credible. My name is Adaraxilia, and I'm in high school. Last year, I went through a bad episode of depression. I'm doing much better currently, and I was scrolling on TikTok and found a video of a girl who claimed she shifted into another reality in her sleep. At that point in my life, going to another reality, even just for a few hours a day, sounded great to me. Out of curiosity, I looked up tutorials and other info on YouTube, and it soon became an obsession. For about eight whole months, I dedicated my free time to learning how to shift. The shifting I'm talking about is not the kind where people say they went to an anamime or Hogwarts or whatever. My desired reality, as they call it, was just a normal world where some of my problems did not exist. Since there are infinite realities that are similar to ours, I hope to reach one with those qualifications. On February 8, 2023, I decided to try shifting. 
I wrote down the date of when I went to sleep and the details of my desired reality. I tried my best to hold my vision of me waking up in that desired reality for as long as I could, but I fell asleep and had a dream of my previous day at school. I don't think the dream had to do with anything, just adding it. I woke up disappointed and grabbed my phone to turn off my alarm, and I saw that my wallpaper was different. I thought it was weird, but I thought maybe I changed it accidentally somehow because the new wallpaper was an old one I had not too long again. Then things started to get strange as I got ready for school. Things were very slightly different. The pink pot on my desk no longer had the Kirby face I painted on it. My shoes were in a different cubby than I placed them in. I go to a private school, so I place my school shoes in a top cubby so that they are easier to reach. I no longer had a paper cut on my thumb. My blazer was wrinkled and in the laundry even though I washed it, and it on Monday, which would be Feb 6. My jewelry dish was gone, and instead my earrings were just on my nightstand. Those are just a few of the differences I can remember right now. I instantly thought about the shifting thing I tried last night and assumed the worst, which is I am in another reality. I continued on with my day and I found out that no, my problems were not gone, so this was not my desired reality. School was different too. The road lines were much more worn out than usual on the way. Someone who I didn't know personally waved at me at school. I hit my hip really hard on a bench that I have never seen while turning my usual corner pretty fast to get to bio class. Our school banner in the courtyard was different. My assigned seat for religion class was different. My apps on my laptop were arranged differently. A character I had recently gotten in a gotcha game was no longer on my account and the currency count was different. Game was Hawkeye Impact third and the character missing was Hersher of Truth and of a bunch of other small changes that I don't distinctly remember. All I could think about all day was the fact that I was somewhere different and I was not home. I have never been one to be overly stressed and have panic attacks, but the stress was overwhelming and crushing. My head and eyes were hurting by the time I got home. When I got home, I went to bed and tried to shift back. I wrote on a piece of paper home over and over again and put it under my pillow, shifting method, and set it in my head and imagined myself waking up at home again. I fell asleep and woke up. I started crying from relief when I saw my Kirby pot with a face again. The experience felt surreal to me, almost like a really vivid dream and I was very willing to peg it off as one. That's when I checked the date on my phone. It was Friday, February 10th. This meant I spent a day somewhere else. My friend that I didn't recall being with much yesterday as I spent my two breaks in the bathroom panicking. At school even asked me if I was all right and that she was worried about me last night since I had been acting different and was very stressed out yesterday. She knows that I am struggling with depression. I said it was nothing and that I was perfectly fine. Does this mean that I switched consciousnesses with another me? And if that was the case, did we both try to shift that same night, or was it just me? Did I shift? Was this a dream? Was it something else? Either way, I took this as a sign to never try shifting ever again. I'm a dive master in the Gulf of Mexico. I was dragging our anchor out over the sand and away from the wreck when I noticed a small object out in the sand. I swim up to it, and it was a dive slate covered in barnacles. I'm thinking of yay, free dive gear, as I make my ascent. So I'm topside. Customers are all settled in talking up their dives, so I decide to check out my new toy. This dive slate was a bit different from others I've seen. It had a wrist strap and has these flip-up slates, so it has three pages. It had a build-up of barnacles, so I took out my knife to shuck some of them off. After I was satisfied the front was clean, I opened it to the second page on it. In just a faint bit of graphite, it said, This story is 100% true. 
That means there may be some typos, and it may not be as fantastic as some things you read. But it scared two armed guys who have experience in the woods. My friend and I used to hunt in Ocala National. I would drive us into the forest with all our stuff, and then we would hike for miles. We would look for signs of wildlife like deer rubs, scrapes, tracks, and poop. We often came across signs of coyotes and bears as well. Often we would start our hike in the morning, get back in the car and go get lunch, then return around 1 p.m. and hike until dark. This time we went in late, like 2 or 3 p.m. I really wanted to check out an area where a controlled burn is just now regrowing its vegetation. Deer paths are a bit easier to follow through those, hog's bed down in the muddy parts, and it's a perfect spot to set up a stand since it's a wide open area. This area was about two miles and another half mile down an old logging trail. It took about two hours to get there. We don't walk loudly or quickly because it's soft sand on the road and we'll look for tracks. Sometimes follow a trail. Now, it's not incredibly desolate. There is a hard clay road we drive in on. I drove my BMW 740IL and my Infinitic. G30 7XSE. Easy. The roads we usually follow on foot are only accessible by lifted 4x4, but it's clear from the ruts that they're used at least a few times a week. Plus, no matter how far we go in, we find beer cans and bullet casings and signs of a fire. Usually when we arrive in the morning, there are a few trucks with dog cages parked on the side. The good old boys run dogs through the sectors, so we try to avoid those areas. The dogs aren't cute puppies, they're mean and drag wild hogs down by their ears. So best to avoid them, and their owners. They're usually good guys, but I'd rather not run into them when they're hunting. Anyway, we went in deeper than usual this time, hoping to get away from all those dogs and noise, and to check out that burned patch that was just starting to grow again. We saw much of the ordinary, deer and coyote tracks. We also saw some bear tracks, big ones and little ones, both cool and bad. The only black bear I don't want to see is a mama bear with her cubs. They get very aggressive. So we reach the burn field and see a whole lot of nothing. We sit for a while and have a snack to see if anything comes through. After about an hour, we decided to explore a small, seemingly fresh trail, then head out like pushing brush out of the way kind of trail. We found the remains of a very old tree stand down the trail, in a beer can that was still shiny, and a pair of underwear that didn't look real old. We thought that was kind of funny. Some dude got drunk and shit himself or something hunting deer. Oh, I should mention we are armed to the teeth, both of us having an uh, AR-15 and a sidearm with extra magazines plus hunting knives. I'm a decent shot, my friend, is an NRA instructor. Anyway, we totally mistimed our walk out, and it got dark while we were still deep in the forest. There was only a sliver of moon, so it was dark. Luckily, I brought my flashlight, and I had a light mounted on my gun. The trails are marked by ribbons on trees and can be hard to spot at night. I know that because we took a wrong turn. It's around 10, 11 p.m. at this point, and we are still walking and came to a crossroad we didn't recognize, and we realized we'd be walking for 30 minutes down the wrong trail. So instead of taking the trail heading west, we just decided to backtrack. You can't really know which direction a trail leads in the forest. On the way back, we started hearing sounds. We figured it was rabbits or squirrels. No problem. So we continue, and the sounds clearly become the movement of one animal. So we turn out lights out thinking it's a deer or a hog and stop walking. We wait for the sounds to get closer. I slowly realize that this doesn't sound like something moving on four legs, but sometimes deer can do that. They step with two legs at a time when they're trying to be quiet. The sound suddenly stopped. Deer must have smelled us but it felt like it stopped close by, so I turned my light on and panned around. Now remember, this trail is barely wide enough for us to stand next to each other. So it's just forest on both sides and you can't see far in. 
I shine around and see nothing and hear nothing. We wait a minute, then give up and keep walking. Another twenty, thirty minutes go by and we start hearing rustling again. This time it's something really moving, not tiptoeing around. We figure it's a group of hogs, which made us a little nervous. Those things can suddenly surround you without you even realizing, but it clearly sounded like it was on our right. Also, small animals sound like bears when it's dark and quiet. Much louder than you would think. We stop on the trail to let whatever is coming pass over the trail in front of us. As soon as the rustling gets near the trail, I turn my rifle light and my friend shines the flashlight directly down the trail in front of us. About thirty yards in front of us, we just see a pair of white legs cross the trail and disappear into the woods. Okay, now we are freaked out. They look human, and it's another forty-five minutes of walking to get to the four-by-four, four only road. Then ten, fifteen minutes until we reach the car, and it all starts with walk straight ahead, where the thing crossed the trail. We definitely were weirded out. But both of us were armed and ready, so we just kept going. Not much else to do. Not to mention it's midnight and we are tired. We hear the noises once more off in the distance, but it never came closer. We reach the car, and usually we like to hang out for a while, check out the stars, and talk. But we both had a gut feeling to just get in the car and go. We kept our guns loaded and hopped in the front seats. Remember, I am driving a normal sedan, not some off-road vehicle. So I have to take it easy, turning around and leaving. I can't speed down this road. It's hard clay, but rain creates divots, ruts, and mud. Well, I go not even a quarter mile down the road, and I have to swerve around a deep rut. My headlights fall onto a guy standing there about ten feet from the woods. No trail or road going in. He is in a farmer's shirt and shorts. No backpack, gun, hat, flashlights, or anything I could see. He didn't wave at us like he was lost, just standing there. He didn't look at us while we passed him, but he started slowly walking down the road as we went by. This is not an area where anyone has cabins for many, many miles, nor is there any civilization for a good ten miles. This guy had no reason to be there. Is this guy? What we saw cross our path. How would he trample through the woods for miles? This brush is not like the pine wood forests of the northeast. It's thick scrub with nettles and palmetto bushes that cut you and snakes and ticks and all kinds of bullshit. I wouldn't walk through it in a long sleeve hoodie and jeans and boot, let alone a short sleeved shirt and shorts. And why the f was he following us? Did we stumble upon this guy's hangout spot when we found the fresh beer can and underwear? We did not call FWC or the police. I don't know why. I guess we just did not want to deal with them. Plus, they would be suspicious of us being out in the woods that late. We both were certain we saw human legs cross the trail, but it seemed so unlikely we decided we were seeing shit. Then we see this guy standing in the pitch dark with no moon and no flashlight. What if it's true that this crazy f was stomping through thick brush? He had been close enough to us that if he charged, he definitely could have tackled one of us before we could react. That is the weirdest thing that has happened to me in Ocala National Forest. I am not scared to go back. Typically, wherever the dogs run is a safe area. They scare off anything that would hurt you. Including people, but I would rather not walk for hours in the pitch dark, just hoping our flashlights didn't run out of battery. We had our phones turned off to save battery in case we had to make an emergency call, if we even had service. At least we could use it as an emergency flashlight. Feel free to ask questions. I may have misremembered some parts. I wrote this at different times throughout my day, so there may be some parts that don't line up. He'll fill in those gaps tomorrow. It's 3:30 a.m. now, and I don't want to edit on mobile. Thanks for reading. My event took place on 2020, one at 18 in Denver, Colorado. In the two half years following my event, I've had a host of very strange phenomena happen to me. 
I have been shy about talking about these things, from what I believe is a result of my interaction with this object. The event started with me witnessing a bright yellow cylinder craft hovering above Interstate 70 just east of Denver. At the time, I felt a sudden fear, but that feeling quickly changed to euphoria. I don't remember much after that other than waking in my bed the next morning. About two months after my encounter sighting, all of the moles on my body began to fade and then completely disappear. To date, five moles have completely disappeared and nine more are in different states of fading. About five months after this event occurred, all of the hair on my arms and legs began to change to light blonde in mass. I have medium brown hair and I'm only 30, one years old. Although I originally considered premature graying, I began to notice the individual hairs change color from the root upwards. And when the hair started to change, it took about five days for the complete hair change. The top of the hair fading from medium brown to reddish to blonde. So it was not as if it was growing out this color and no amount of sun exposure has ever caused lightning like this on me before. Also, the hairs that have changed colors have actually changed in consistency. They were originally a medium coarseness, and now they are feather-soft fine. About two months ago, the spider veins in my legs began to fade, and now one that I have had for about seven years is completely gone, and another is fading rapidly. Since this has occurred, I have had dreams almost nightly of entities who talk to me and claim to be intelligent species from somewhere else, and they keep trying to give me strange information I don't understand. I woke up a few times and caught myself uttering some language that I've never heard before, but I have ruled out speaking in tongues because it seems this language seems to have structure and form. I also have feelings of hot and cold in different parts of my body. I get pulsating feelings on the bottom of my feet, up my legs, down my arms, and on the palms of my hands. Sometimes this pulsating becomes so intense it is painful. I have also felt this heat pulsating feeling right below my eyes. Between my eyes and in the front of my brain, I am very upset and confused as to what is going on with me. I live on the back of the ranch where I work. I got the job in college and I've graduated since. But working the olive orchard or vineyard since has been pretty gratifying. My first year living on site, third year working there, I got really drunk and drove the utility vehicle I'm responsible for out into the enchanted forest. This is the place the cows run off to when a bad rainstorm comes through. The ranch hand before me took off immediately when my boss told him to move out so I could take over. And when I did so, there were 15 head of cattle. I was on top of this number and counted them each and every day I fed them. Some calves had come in, so the number had jumped up. But the point was that if something happened to a particular cow, I would notice by the end of the day and could search for her or him if it was a bull. Anyways, I'm toasted and enjoying revving this Kawasaki mule up and down the different hilly sections of the far end of the ranch by starlight when a shit ton of vultures burst into the air in front of me. I screech to a halt as a horrible smell fills the air and find myself staring into the maggoty eyes of a recently dead cow. She's still got flesh, so she hasn't been dead long, but I don't recognize her from the small herd I deal with every day. There's a thick scent of death and something else in the air. I leave the headlights on the mule running and circle around her with my LED flashlight and see a huge sickly flesh balloon dropped out from between her hind legs. Working on a ranch, you get used to death because it's a huge part of the whole thing. But the strange smell behind the familiar scent was this pouch coming out of her containing her stillborn fetus. As best I can figure, she had died attempting to give birth after the herd had rejected her following her isolation from them during some kind of sickness under the previous ranch and term, something he had never mentioned to me or my boss. 
The smell was worse the next day when I used a forklift to carry or drag her into a shallow grave in order to dump lime all over her. But stumbling across her while chasing a stargazing spot is forever etched into my mind. During the summer of 1989, my girlfriend and I decided to take a few days and go visit my mother and family in Spokane, Washington. We lived in Southern California and I have driven north to visit her a few times. I usually stick to the main interstates for fear of running out of gas. Anyway, on this particular drive, I decided to take a shortcut through Oregon to try and save some time. I saw on the map that Highway 97 would be a good route to take. I knew that Bend was a fairly good-sized town with services if I needed them. The night was beautiful with a little moonlight, so I opened up the moonroof on the car so I could peek up at it from time to time. The road had tall timbers on both sides, and it was pitch black beyond them. My girlfriend was asleep at the time. The road took a slow curve to the right. I was probably driving around 50, 55 miles per hour when suddenly to my right, my headlights lit up a huge hairy creature. It was walking upright on two legs and heading the same direction I was traveling so I couldn't see a face. I could make out its height of about seven, eight feet. I had to look up out of the windshield at it. It had redish, dirty brown hair, broad shoulders, and a short neck with a rounded head. I quickly put my foot on the brake, hoping my tail lights would give my view from my rear view mirror, but it didn't work. I took the next turn out, which was a few hundred feet down the road. I woke up my girlfriend and told her what I saw. At first, she thought I was kidding around until I turned the car around and went back to see if it was still there. No luck. It must have got spooked and made off into the woods. I'm an avid hunter and outdoorsman. I know what bears and elk and moose look like, and this was neither. I know what I saw, and it was him. I will never forget that night. When I tell my friends of the story, they believe me because I'm a very trustworthy guy, and I don't make up stories for the hell of it. I lived in a rural area, though it was fairly close, 25 miles, to the nearest city and maybe 10 miles to the nearest town. One day I was riding the bus to school and saw an odd collection of trash, a mannequin, shopping cart, and tarp hanging from a tree in the woods to the side of the road. A few days later I noticed it was gone and figured somebody had cleaned it up. Things got weird when it reappeared on a different road after a week or two. This happened a few times over the course of a couple months, and I didn't tell anyone because it sounded a bit crazy. Really late one night, I was watching TV, and my neighbor's dog started barking. This isn't unusual, but the nights are extremely quiet, and I heard an odd rattling that eventually sounded like a shopping cart. I turned off the TV, hid under the blankets, and watched a disheveled person push a shopping cart with a mannequin in it past my house. This was during the middle of winter. It's bitterly cold. The wind is deadly and feet of snow are fairly common. There was zero chance anyone would believe me, so I never said anything. Fast forward several years later and I was home from college for the summer. My mom is an adult protective worker and tells me about a referral she got involving a schizophrenic homeless guy who pushes a mannequin. His wife, apparently around in a shopping cart, this was in the city, but she then tells me he, for some reason, walked all the way to my area and lived in the woods for an entire winter eating roadkill and God knows what else. I honestly don't know how to explain what had happened to me. I believe I saw some sort of Native American entity. I was working as a ranger for the city of Austin, Texas. I just had one left of our reserve campsites when a very strange thing occurred. This was about 10, 30 at night. I was driving my four-wheel drive pickup truck on a dirt road that led back to the entrance of the park. The area is a wooded hillside spanning 200 acres and contains a very large number of wildlife. 
So being nighttime and how many animals are nocturnal, I was watching up for signs of their movement on either side of me. It was quiet, and I was the only one around. I had been following the road closely when I got this strong sensation. The road, everything around it, dense woods. I looked up just as a deer ran out in front of my truck directly in my path. It was something like 40 yards ahead of me when I saw it. I reacted immediately by pulling onto the shoulder, slamming my brakes. The deer now was only about 10 feet away from my truck when I swerved and it vanished as soon as it went out of sight. The feeling that it told me to look up subsided. Everything went back to normal. There were no other cars on the road, of course, being just mine. I sat in place, trying to collect my bearings. My heart was beating fast, and I had a headache, and I couldn't explain these feelings. What on earth? So, something brought my attention to the hillside, right where the deer had come from, and that's when I saw a movement about 50 yards into the brush. It wasn't clear. I got out of my truck to inspect and walked up to the spot where I thought I had seen the movement through the tree line. The woods were pretty thick, but about twenty feet into them, there was a small opening in trees with lower branches and ones that were not as wide or tall. They almost kind of formed a natural corridor that, maybe, I'd say fifty yards opened up to the hillside before becoming obscured by the other trees and foliage. The ground sloped slightly upward, many leaves. I called out with my flashlight, thinking why would there be somebody out here? It didn't make any sense. Thinking maybe I was just seeing things or it might be another deer, there was no answer and that was it. I assumed it was just my own paranoia. Now I didn't hear anything move past me so I decided to inspect further because why not? Calling out loudly I knew, at least I'm pretty sure I saw a movement, and again there should be no reason at all why anybody should be this far out here late at night. The movement I saw was more like a person, not a deer. At least I'm sure of it. So I kind of very shortly walked up the hillside, never hearing a sound. I decided finally that, okay, enough is enough. I'm gonna leave and head back to my truck. As soon as I got in, I realized there was something wrong. Something strange and paranormal, if you will. As soon as I got back in my truck, that's when I saw it coming out of the woods ahead of me, slightly up from where the deer emerged. It is what I can only unmistakably describe as an apparition. It was this glowing, translucent being, but unmistakably a spirit. It shimmered, seeming to be faint, but nearly transparent. It came closer to my truck and appeared as if it were getting bigger, but also darker and more solid at the same time. It was this light grayish color and then would grow darker in color, kind of pulsating. It just walked right past the front of my truck with no fear or concern about my presence whatsoever. It just walked by like nothing was there, with some kind of purposeful stride, without having so much as even a look of curiosity. And then, right there in my view, it just vanished, fading into obscurity. Not wasting a second, I flew my vehicle out of there, and my only mission in that moment was to go. Go! Go, go! Before this... I thought ghosts were a joke. I had never been a believer in the paranormal or what many referred to as the spirit realm. But after this, that changed my mind, and I'll never forget what I saw. But it wasn't until the following morning when I really kind of fully mentally processed what I saw, surprisingly, because I didn't sleep that much. But a thought occurred to me, and I realized what had really happened. What I saw looked like a stereotypical image of a native, long hair down to its shoulders, feathers, a headdress, actually. My professional theory is that somebody, a Native American, has gone through this road many times before in their lifetime, and they're simply showing me something that happened here at some point along the way. Maybe they stumbled upon these woods at night, and for whatever reason they were killed on the spot by first contact European settlers who probably had no qualms about killing anybody different than them, including women and children. I do not believe this entity or spirit to have been malicious. It didn't come off as that. It was just something that happened to them in their lifetime. 
This spirit was merely doing whatever some non-physical thing does when in the process of trying to relive what happened. It's a possibility that this spot is where these people might have been killed or injured in an altercation. Maybe they were stuck between this world and the next. I don't know. Maybe they've seen my truck hundreds of times out here late at night over the years, and now I'm able to pick up on whatever happens to come through here. Who knows? Anyway, that's my experience with the paranormal. Hopefully, it will be my last. I have family in law enforcement, and I found these old archive files. Well, my grandfather did, because he has access to documents. This is an old printout of something that I found very interesting, so I thought I would share it with you. Here you go, May 20. 2nd, 1984, Officer LG was patrolling the area around a local park during the night shift. At approximately 1.25 a.m., the officer reported veering off course to investigate flashing lights in an adjacent wooded section of the city, spotting several bright lights slowly hovering along the tree line. As he drove closer to investigate, his vehicle reportedly lost power and stalled. As he approached, an object described as having a dark body with many bright lights hovered silently above him, roughly 300 feet away. The object allegedly reeled out some type of thin black cord, which struck and wrapped around his police car as it backed away from him. The object then took off into the air and disappeared into darkness. Officer L.G. wrote his account of the event on May 24, 1984. The following day, he reported the incident to command, who denied anything had happened and insisted that his vehicle was in perfect working order. Officer LG's police cruiser was inspected by technicians at the city garage, who found nothing wrong with it mechanically. No evidence of alterations or unusual damage were noted after inspection. No support for Officer L.G.'s claim would come from local authorities until three months later when another officer, Officer A.F., called into dispatch reporting a very similar object near the same park, along with reports of several other officers who had also spotted strange lights descending toward a tree line, then vanishing without explanation. Thereafter, Officer A.F. and Officer L.G. were reportedly ridiculed by command to stop spreading rumors, ultimately leading to Officer L.G. being permanently dismissed from duty. I was recently working near a river in the British Columbia wilderness when about 20 meters from me and my co-worker we heard loud footsteps crashing through the trees. My co-worker yelled out, Nothing! The footsteps continued, but after he yelled out a second time, the footsteps stopped, and then things went completely silent. There was other people in the vicinity throughout the week, but to our knowledge, nobody there that day. I grew up hunting, and I'm very familiar with the fauna of western Canada. It sounded like a bull or cow moose or elk, perhaps a sizable buck. But to my knowledge, they don't have the smarts to actively hide from humans when they are yelled at. Same with bears. Mountain lions, however, do, but I don't believe one would ever be so loud and clumsy sounding. WTF was in the woods. I'm not above thinking it was perhaps a Bigfoot, or was it a sinister person? In 2014, I was living with my then-girlfriend, now wife, and our son in a forest house close to the center of Bolton in northwest England. The house is what we call a two, up two, down here because they have two rooms upstairs and two rooms downstairs. The stairs ran down the kitchen side of the wall that divided the two downstairs rooms. My girlfriend was working on a course to become a veterinary nurse. For this, she had to work the 2 p.m. to 11 p.m. shifts, so there was just me and my son in the house. I had put him to bed a few hours before and was now downstairs washing the pot and pans. I heard footsteps on the landing and assumed it was my son. 
thinking he had woken up and was now running around upstairs looking for us. As he was apt to do, I dried my hands and prepared to go through the routine of putting him back to bed. But I noticed these were not the erratic footsteps of a child, but the heavy, deliberate footsteps of an adult. The footsteps began to descend the stairs. I turned to see not my son, but a tall woman dressed in a long white gown. As her head came into view, I could see she was well over six feet tall and had long blonde hair. The stairs curved to the left as they approached the ground. As this woman rounded the corner, I saw her face. She looked odd. Her features were human, but something was off about them. Like she was something imitating a human. As she took the last step towards the floor, she vanished. I stood still in shock for a few moments, but then plucked up the courage to go upstairs and check on my son. Thankfully, he was still fast asleep. About half an hour later, my girlfriend got home. I was still slightly shaken up, but happy to see another real human. She wasn't all that surprised, which was a bit unnerving. She had lived there for a few years before I met her, and most people who visited experienced something in that house mostly knocks and bangs at all hours and ghost cats. The bangs could have been the neighbors, to be fair. Having to tell people the cat they just saw run through the house isn't your cat is always a fun conversation. Thankfully, the full-body apparitions weren't all that common. Me and a buddy went camping on my parents' property back in high school, say, six years ago. The spot is pretty secluded, and the only company we had for miles were cows and coyotes. We fished all day, and it just settled in around a nice little campfire when I heard a helicopter. We were somewhat near a pipeline, so it wasn't that unusual for planes and choppers to check it, but I'd never seen them do so at night. The helicopter continued to get closer until we were able to see it silhouetted against the stars. We didn't think anything was amiss at first until I noticed the black sphere literally suspended about four feet in front of it. The sphere was roughly the same size as the chopper and traveling at the same speed. This was without alcohol, drugs, etc. No idea what it was to this day. I went camping out near Dotsero, Colorado. It's a more desert-like area in the state park, IRC, was up on a tall plateau. It was about a half hour drive up, free camping. No utilities or amenities or anything, just find a spot and enjoy. There were forests and whatnot up top, but not much else beyond that and all the dust. We stayed there three days, and what creeped me out off the bat was the fact that there were no bird sounds, or really any small critters, no chirping, no tiny bodies flitting about, nothing. Pure silence outside of the many flies. There were in fact birds there, because the next morning we found a dead one behind our tent, among the trees. It wasn't there before, it was fresh. We go out for the day come across a large herd of sheep grazing on a trail, but still no birds. The next morning after that, the bird was torn to shreds. Feathers here, bits there, all around the trees to the back of us and around our campsite. So this detail is a bit important for the next part. We have brought our dogs with us. Mine's a straight dingus and has no use except for being a cuddle bug, but my fiancé's corgi is amazingly perceptive sharp vision and sharp hearing, but also super friendly. She wasn't friendly the night before we left. We had a fire going and it was completely silent like the nights before. Not even cricket chirps or anything, just a crackling fire. And Susie growling at something in the dark. She wouldn't turn her head and look elsewhere. She kept looking to the trees behind the tent, yet again, just growling and with a ridge of fur standing on her back. We'd shine our lights back there. It was a thin line of trees, nothing thick, and wouldn't see anything. She continued to growl until we doused the fire, and everybody piled into the tent. The next morning, some animal had pissed in their water dish. It was very yellow, green and rank, and I couldn't leave that place fast enough. 
It was probably just a raccoon or something small like that, but still, up. This occurred in Oakland, California, where my wife's parents live. There have been several shootings in the area, more than normal, and the funeral home on International Drive has been getting a lot of business. A few weeks ago, my in-laws were driving through Oakland at around 2 a.m. in the morning. My mother-in-law works as a live and hospice nurse and only has a day or so off. She was coming back at 2 a.m. after having the evening off. While they were driving to her job, they saw a woman standing on the corner next to the funeral home with a dress on and very well dressed. They saw her at the corner while they were stopped at the intersection and noticed that the woman smiled at them. They also noticed that her eyes were black. My in-laws were frightened and drove away as fast as they could. My father-in-law drops off my mother-in-law at her work and wonders if that ghost woman he saw at the corner will be there on the way back. He had to go through that same intersection. On his way back, she was still there at the corner, and this time he was stuck at the light at the intersection. She actually waved to him, and he noticed again she had black eyes. It seemed like she was trying to get him to come over and pick her up. Naturally, when the light turned green, he sped out of that intersection to get home. No one seems to know who she is, but they all seem to agree that her funeral was probably through the funeral home there on that street. As to why she was on that street between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., I think she was looking for victims. I spent 20 eight years in the United States Navy, almost all on aircraft carriers. I've witnessed some awesome things at sea, bioluminescence for one. But the creepiest was probably one of my deployments to the Persian Gulf, early 2000s. We sailed through acres and acres of dead sheep. Apparently one of the big ships that hauls sheep up to the Emirates from Australia had a big die-off, and they simply dumped all the carcasses over the side. There had to be thousands of them. Aside from that, another time in the Gulf, we frequently saw huge balls of sea snakes. It is creepy as that. I was fishing in a pond about 15 miles from town. It was late in the evening, and it was brewing up a rainstorm. I was with my cousin, who is a couple of years younger than I. I was under a tree near the lake, and I kept seeing something shiny across the lake. If I tried very hard, I could cast across the pond. I was aware of the lightning and thunder. It was a rough storm with plenty of lightning. I noticed that the shiny spots were large and an equal distance apart. I could see the beings better when the lightning made everything bright. I kept looking for a while until I realized what they were. There were more than I saw, I'm sure, because they were all walking a path across from me. It is rather bushy on that side, except for a trail that comes over the hill. We had parked about a half mile from the lake because of a fence. It was easier to walk than go around. After I noticed they were real, I called out to my cousin, who had walked off a little ways. They kept looking at me than at him, their eyes still shining. Their eyes were big and round and had slight oriental slant to them. They were short and skinny, long arms, big heads. But not long heads, but large. I called to my cousin and told him what I was looking at. He came running and we picked up what we could and ran up to the truck. When we got to the truck, we looked back and could see more of them, but we were too scared to look for long. We rushed off and decided not to tell anyone. Now that I'm older, I worry about my grandkids. This is a private lake and is used by few people. I have no pics. We did not carry cell phones at the time. Since they have been here for years, I don't think they are destructive to us, but they could be. My old man served in the Royal Navy and Merchant Navy. He told me about these access spaces that ran through the ship. One ran the full length of the bulk carrier he was on in a storm, and some poor sod had to do down there to do something. They opened it up, and there's lights all along it. 
As the ship flexed in the storm, they could see the lights at the end disappear and reappear. Wasn't exactly a rush of volunteers to go down there. He always said that St. Elmo's fire could be quite eerie when you saw it on another ship. Worst he ever told me about was when they got a mayday call from another ship that was on fire. They were the nearest and responded, but were a good 48 hours away. The radios died before they got there. No one survived. Me, my father, and uncle were out one evening hunting during the early archery season. This is southern Indiana, so you can certainly get in areas very far away from other human beings. But this is not like being in remote Montana or, or something. We, we had hiked pretty far back into a big valley. People imaging Indiana is flat, but that is northern part. Southern Indiana is very hilly and rocky. We saw nothing and began to head back. At this point, it was dark, and we were about halfway up the valley. Once we got to the top, it was a much easier walk that eventually connected to a fire trail. I want to repeat, I'm sure there is a very rational, boring explanation to this. Well, we are walking, and all of a sudden there is this. Noise behind us. I can't explain it. If you talk to people who spend a lot of time in the outdoors, they can all tell you weird sounds you hear. I mean, it happens. What made this one so weird is it was unlike anything we have ever heard. It was loud, very loud. The best we can describe it is was a horrible screech with a mix of a growl. I can still hear that noise in my head today. It was genuinely terrifying, and in the woods in early archery, season can be very noisy, but when this screech or growl happened, it got quiet. Maybe that was just our brains focusing on the unusual noise and ignoring the standard forest background noise. But we all remember this noise and how it echoed through the woods, and it sounds so unnatural it sounded. It sounded angry. It seems like I'm rambling, but I just can't tell you how terrifying this noise was. Nothing in any horror film or sound effect has come close to replicating that sound. There are no words to give it justice. This is when shit really hits the fan. The second this noise happened, we all of course froze. I was young, but still had spent quite a bit of time in the wood, but my father and uncle have spent a lot of time in the woods, and it was very dark, and my uncle was just barely visible in front of mine, and my father, and our headlamps glow, but I remember we all froze in fear, and he turned back to my father me me and asked what was and in the process of him saying that we were all three turning around back towards the noise you have to remember this all happened very quickly in reality from the time this awful noise happened and we turned around it had been maybe five seconds but as we all collectively turned around there was this bright flash of light i know how insane that sounds and to this day, when we tell this story, people usually start to smile or laugh, but I am as serious as a heart attack. As we turned around, there was this sudden flash of light in the treetops. It was bright and covered a very wide area. It lasted a second or two, and it went pitch black again. It was just like the cliché. All three of us, with zero words, began to run. There was not yelling, no pause, nothing. We all three just ran as fast as we could. My father even started pulling at me up this steep incline, but none of us spoke a thing until we got back to our vehicles. Now I do not believe it was a UFO. Shit, I honestly do not believe in UFOs at all. There is no road in that direction, but we like to think that maybe the conditions were just right and some large vehicle on a road nearby had their lights hit the treetops or... Maybe it was like somebody with a flare or some shit, but we have all been in the woods and seen cars drive by, many with their blinders on to watch for deer, and this light was not like this. It was sudden, bright, white, and was in the treetops. I mean, as batshit as this sounds, it was like those cheesy UFO movies where the alien ship hovers and shines a big light from above. I am not saying that is what it is, but that is the best way to describe it. We have honestly spent over ten years 
running through scenarios, and even though my brain tells me, dude, this shit happens, do not fall for this. It was just an unusual set of circumstances, and in the darkness, your brain put the pieces together the best it could. There was no creature or UFO, but it is hard sometimes when you replay that event in your head. If it had maybe been the noise or the light alone, I think we would blow it off, but it all happened together, and that is what really sticks with us all. I'm going to be that old guy telling this story with the young people mocking me, and I can't blame them. I would too, but that does not change what happened and what I experienced. I'll start out by saying that the small town where I grew up, and where all of my family still resides, is in Monroe County, Ohio maybe 20 minutes or so outside of Wheeling, West Virginia. I was talking to my dad on the phone the other night. He told me that last week while driving home from work, he came across something he can't explain. His voice was shaky, unlike I have ever heard him. He works the night shift at a local coal mine, and while driving home from work early one morning around 5, 30 a.m., he noticed a large creature crouched down in the road. It had bright red glowing eyes that looked directly at him. He said this creature also had very large wings which were wrapped around it as it crouched. He said he had never in his life seen anything like this. It had really upset him. He proceeded to drive by it, but when he looked behind him, it was gone. He said that he was actually scared to get out of his car when he got home and fear that perhaps it had followed him or was even in his car. After a few very tense minutes, he slowly got out of the car. There was nothing there. I asked him if he had ever heard of the Mothman. He kind of paused, then said that he had never heard of it until he started talking to people about what he had seen. He said that they would say right away, It sounds like you saw the Mothman. You hear weird stories all the time, and because you don't really know the person who witnessed it, you just shrug it off. Knowing my dad and what a logical thinker he is, I believe he encountered something supernatural. He is usually the one who tries to come up with logical answers for things that are otherwise unexplained. He's very skeptical when it comes to aliens, UFOs, ghosts, etc. For me to talk to him and hear him tell me about this Mothman, like creature, was shocking. For this is not like my father. I will say that I am concerned. For what I understand is that when a person actually witnesses a Mothman, oftentimes bad things happen afterward. There isn't a doubt in my mind that what he saw was 100% true. It has completely made a believer out of me when it comes to the Mothman. I hope for the sake of my father and my family that that isn't true and that he made a mistake of identity. Hey everyone, so just to kick off, I am normally super skeptical of anything paranormal and I don't believe in ghosts, but I moved into an apartment 10 months ago and strange things won't stop happening. To start with, I went out of my way to find earthly, uh, if that's the right term, explanations, but I am at the end of my wit and thought that maybe I would post my experiences here and people might help me understand what's happening. So a bit of background. I moved to Lisbon, Portugal last year, and I found an apartment in an old building. I think it was built in 1890. I live by myself, and I have never had a supernatural experience before this. All these events happened over the course of the 10-month period, but I think if I just bullet point everything that happened in chronological order, it's probably the most simple. I was in the bathroom, and I hear a bang in the kitchen. I go out and see that my bananas that were on the kitchen shelf had fallen onto the floor. I hadn't touched anything in the kitchen for a couple of hours, but I figured they may have just been unbalanced and fallen. I am working at my desk in the living room, and the mug in front of me starts moving by itself, and then even changes direction, and starts moving towards me. My reaction was actually like, this is cool. What's happening? I initially thought that it was to do with a condensation trail from the mug, but when I picked up the mug, it's bone dry. 
like I had had a cup of tea the day before and not cleaned it up yet. I tried banging the desk, but I couldn't get the mug to move at all. I woke up and saw a girl at the end of my bed. A girl I was dating was staying over that night, so I assumed it was her and that she had woken up. I asked, are you all right? And she didn't reply. I repeated the question and still no reply, so I reached over to tap her on the shoulder, and when I started to lean across, I realized the girl I was dating was still asleep next to me. The hit of adrenaline suddenly filled my body and went from being half asleep to wide awake. I was thinking, if she is here, who is at the end of my bed? Even at that moment, I was thinking I must have dreamt it, but I looked up and the girl was still there at the end of the bed. I stared in disbelief, and her figure just slowly faded away. I was left stunned. I knew I'd been awake the whole time because I had taken my retainer out to speak, and it was still in my hand. I had started feeling uneasy ever since seeing the girl, and at 2 a.m. in the morning, I heard a bang in the kitchen. I had to really build myself up to go out there, and I had convinced myself I had probably heard something from another apartment. But when I went into the kitchen, a load of cans from the middle shelf, the same one as the bananas, were on the floor, and everything on the shelf had been knocked over, like someone had swiped it with their arm. At this point, I started telling people about these things at this point, which is kind of a weird feeling as an unbeliever. I tried to make an explanation for everything that had happened, but I couldn't really come up with a convincing story. I realized that a few things had gone missing from my apartment, like a few items of clothes and a small ball I used to help to stretch my foot. I look everywhere in my apartment, which is really small, but I never find anything. I also found a human scale on the floor. Super disgusting, I know. I had no scabs on my body at this point, and my only explanation is that maybe it stuck to the bottom of my shoe and I brought it into my apartment. I also find hairs on the floor that do not belong to me. I hardly have any visitors, so again, this is quite a confusing thing to find. Everything then kind of settled down for a bit, and then last night, and I had another thing happen. 5. This morning, my jogging bottoms, I think you would call them sweatpants in the States, were on the floor and were soaking wet. At first, I didn't find this really weird, but then I started thinking about it. How did this happen? I was wearing them yesterday, so they were definitely dry during the day, and nothing else in the apartment was wet, no leak from the roof. The floor around them was dry, and there were no drip marks. I even checked the sinks in the shower, and they were completely dry. Even the non-paranormal explanations I could think of made me feel uneasy. I realized my door wasn't properly locked last night. Could someone have come into my apartment, wet my pants, and then lift? I am sleepwalking. The jogging bottom smelt just of water, but they were completely soaked, like they had been submerged in water. I just can't think how it could have happened. I'm actually moving out of my apartment really soon, but this whole experience has left me creeped out. Maybe there is a logical explanation for everything. But I'm struggling. What are your thoughts? What should I do? A few years ago, I was lying in my bed, drifting in and out of sleep. My eyes were closed, and my mind was on the verge of entering dreamland when I suddenly heard a strange noise coming from my doorway. It was a peculiar sound, like a faint whisper or a soft hum. Curiosity got the better of me, and I slowly opened my eyes, allowing them to adjust to the darkness of my room. And what I saw sent a shiver down my spine. There, right in front of me, was a six-foot spherical light surrounded by a mysterious gray mist. It hovered in the air, emanating an otherworldly glow. I watched in awe and disbelief as the ethereal light moved slowly from my doorway towards my window. It seemed to glide effortlessly, almost as if it were dancing through the air. My heart raced, and I couldn't tear my eyes away from the mesmerizing sight. Then, without warning, the luminous sphere faded right through the solid bedroom wall. It vanished into thin air, leaving behind a lingering sense of wonder and uncertainty. 
I was left in complete awe, struggling to comprehend what I had just witnessed. The next day, my little brother approached me, excitement and curiosity etched across his face. He asked if I had seen something strange in our shared experience. It turned out that he, too, had witnessed the same enigmatic phenomenon. He described how he saw it materialize in his room, passing through the very same wall that I had observed it fade next to. Our minds were filled with questions and a shared sense of wonder. What was that strange, spherical light? Where did it come from and where did it go? We couldn't find any logical explanation to make sense of it all. That extraordinary encounter stayed with us, becoming a cherished memory that bound us together. It was an unexplainable event that sparked our imaginations and instilled a deep curiosity about the mysteries of the universe. To this day, we still recount that night when the spherical light shrouded in gray mist captivated our senses. It serves as a reminder that there are realms beyond our understanding, hidden just beyond the confines of our ordinary lives, and perhaps one day we will uncover the secrets behind that ethereal visitor and the magical journey it took through our bedroom walls. Around 4 p.m. yesterday, I was in my bathroom when I heard something fall to the floor above me. I kind of shrugged it off at the time. Fast forward to about 2 a.m. I was in my living room. My grandma was sleeping on the couch, and my uncle was sleeping in his room. Suddenly, right above me, I heard loud, heavy footsteps walking across the attic. My cat heard it, too, because she bolted up the cat tree and looked directly up at the ceiling in the same spot. So, I know I'm not crazy. I'm scared to death. I haven't slept yet, and my family is telling me not to call the police. My uncle is going to check when he gets home from work. I don't know if it's an alien ghost or an actual human up there. I just don't see how anyone could have gotten up there considering it's inaccessible. My uncle is trying to shrug it off as a bird or squirrels, but no way would a squirrel walk or sound like that. Update. My uncle and I went up there, and there were no signs of anything ever being up there. The part of the house where I heard the heavy footsteps is sealed off from the rest of the attic. There is absolutely no access to it, so this definitely turned a lot more paranormal. My brother and I had embarked on a hunting expedition in the vast and untamed wilderness of Alaska. Our sights were set on the elk that roamed these lands with rifles slung over our shoulders and determination burning in our hearts. We ventured into the dense thicket, relentlessly searching for any signs of our quarry. Hours turned into days as we scoured the nearby woods, our anticipation mounting with each passing moment. Yet, despite our tireless efforts, the prey seemed to elude us, leaving us with naught but the echoes of our own footsteps. Undeterred, we made camp under the starlit sky, our tents providing a temporary refuge amidst the wilderness. The crackling fire cast dancing shadows upon the trees, painting the night with an ethereal glow. As the flames flickered and danced, we contemplated our next move, determined to leave no stone unturned in our pursuit of the prey. It was then that we stumbled upon something unexpected, a small village hidden away in an uncharted part of the woods. Intrigued and driven by curiosity, we ventured towards its center, guided by an inexplicable force that urged us forward. As we drew closer, a pack of wolves emerged from the surrounding wilderness, their piercing eyes fixated upon us. Yet as quickly as they appeared, they vanished into the undergrowth, leaving us with a sense of foreboding. Our footsteps carried us through the village, its eerie stillness permeating the air. We soon beheld a sight that sent a chill down our spines, a massive pile of bones, skulls, and remnants of a forgotten past. It was a macabre collection, a silent testament to the tragedy that had unfolded here many years ago. 
We surmise that over 50 souls had met their untimely demise in the frigid embrace of these unforgiving woods, perhaps a century ago. As we explored further, our eyes fell upon claw marks etched upon the walls of the decaying houses, a haunting reminder of the unknown terror that had descended upon this ill-fated village. Our minds raced with speculation, piecing together fragments of a forgotten tale. What sinister force could have unleashed such devastation upon this place? Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.